Welcome, everyone. I am Chris Gore from Film Threat, and this is Hollywood on the Rocks. Today on the show, The Defiles Part 2 has just dropped on the cover of FilmThreat.com. You can go there right now. Part 2 of Alan Ng's series, The Defiles, has dropped. We're going to be talking about that, plus a little Critics' Choice debriefing. Alan and I will share exclusive videos and our experience at the Critics' Choice Awards. A little controversy uh, that has come up from that. We'll talk about that as well. Plus, your comments, questions, concerns, and we have a very special guest that's going to be joining us at the end of the show, talking about mental health and film festivals. I think this is actually a useful... Uh, Dr. Rebecca Louisa Smith is going to be joining us talking about uh, she's the film festival doctor. We'll talk to her about that. And also working as an independent creator. And the Sundance Film Festival. Is it still relevant? We're going to talk about it. Lots to get into. Your chat comments and questions. Alan Ng is waiting in the wings. Where is he? Where is he? Let's get things started. Let's go. Hollywood on the Rocks on a Wednesday. I thought I saw him here. Prepare her for our pleasure. Love that. Alan! 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 Al! Alan! Ah, like, there we hey, go. how's it going? Good. Oh my gosh. Well, Busy. they're like eight other videos that I wanted to play, but <laughs> I, I, we have too much to talk about today, so we got we to gotta get things rolling. Yeah, we'll have plenty of time next week. Well, no, we'll have time next week because we're, well, we're going to talk about Sundance next week, Sundance mm -hmm. and Slam Dance because we will have seen some of the films. Right yeah. now, it's just beginning and a couple of films. We'll preview Sundance later in the show today, uh, but we got to get started. How are you doing? Oh, I'm busy. I just scrambled this morning to get the D files out. Uh, that I got some big information yesterday that kind of just threw the schedule off, but but it got done. And uh, yeah, now it's it's all the Sundance prep I'm doing right now. Okay, uh, well, let's get into it. Let's look yeah. at your comments and questions before we begin. I love the X-Files logo. Nice touch, says JB's Spooky Review. Not only do we have a logo, we've got an animated. When we get into it, we'll do the animated intro. But uh, you'll see that. Um, the Avengers Rising says, count me in. I hope there's at least eight more of these because there are some important details that need to be brought to light if we are to dethrone Hollywood of these of these big three investors behind it all. True. Naptown Nerd says, will Chris change out of his pajama bottoms before the show or keep them rocking? Sorry to tell you, I didn't have time. I literally went, had a bite to eat, finished the nooner, had a quick bite to eat. I am wearing my pajama bottoms that I got at TJ Maxx. They are a uh, Pabst blue ribbon, very comfy pajama bottoms. Yeah. Uh, and I find so when you do a nooner, the pajama bottoms are the best thing to wear. That's the only way to dress. Uh, Trish page became a new member. Thank you for that. Trish. We appreciate you. Sean who for seven forty two. I didn't even look and I knew it was seven forty two. <laughs> Happy birthday to Mr. James Earl Jones. Oh, happy birthday. And Andrew Montpetit, who's a member. Thank you, Andrew. Hope you are braving the snow right now. I know it's snowy where you are, assuming you haven't flown anywhere. Uh, says, hot off my nooner. Now I'm on the rocks. Hell yeah. Uh, the D is going to punish you, says Luminous, Luminous, ugh, Luminous Brilliance. Jamin D says, relax, people. Chris was having his evening Jack Daniels. That makes me wonder, what is your usual go-to drink? You're not going to like it. I just go with vodka soda because it has the least sugar. And I generally don't get hung over. And then I may switch to hard seltzer, which is light. But um I'm trying to curb my drinking for January, except for at the uh, CCA. 
CCA was on fire. A lot yeah, of how fun. much did you drink there? I mean, let's who's counting, Alan? Who's counting? I know. Uh, the Avengers Rising says, Hello, Chris. Have you thought about expanding your chat with more like you and Alan? My chat? What? Expanding, expanding your chat my... with more like you and Alan. I don't understand the question. Yeah. Because I think I'm here when you chat. Expanding your chat with more like you and you mean like having other people on the show? We've done that when we do our watch parties, we bring other people on. We are considering doing a third show on Mondays. So we would be, we would live stream three days a week instead of two. That will be after Sundance, probably sometime in February. We do have a name for the show and I'm kind of excited about it. Kind of excited. Uh, Jimmy Francis, perfect evening stream to celebrate my first distribution year anniversary of my debut feature. Congratulations, Jimmy Francis. After all the D files are unveiled, do you think you and Alan can do a Warner Brothers files covering WB's mishandling of D of the DC going back to Superman three on why the executives rejected Brainiac for garbage says the Avengers rising. I don't know that that's like D files. If that's sort of a, I mean, that sounds like an article. Um, the D files is interesting because it can't be told in one article. The story mm -hmm. can't be told in one article, which and is it, why it requires a series. And I also think it reflects the entire industry, not just uh, specifically Disney. But exactly. I, I think I think the reason we're going after Disney is because they seem to be the most uh, the most egregious, <laughs> and the uh, you know the one the one that's just out there doing it all wrong. And the Avengers Rising says, was Alan born in Beijing, China, or San Francisco? Uh, I was born in Los Angeles. Born and raised. Yeah. Spent my now, entire life here. I remember when I first met you, my first question was, well, where are you really from? <laughs> and can you go back there? I mean, yeah. to visit. But <laughs> Christopher Moonlight Production says, haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm very interested because I'm working animation at this moment. Also some weird stuff going on with Tubi and indie creators. Don't know if that interests you. I am on Tubi, but yeah. I am not on Tubi from me. I am on Tubi through a distributor. So I have a distributor. The name of the company is Indie Rights. Um, I went with them because I was able to hang on to my Blu-ray rights 100%. And they also are able to do international sales. So those are the two things that convinced me that Indie Rights was the good way to go. And I, I trust uh, Linda Nelson and the team there. So, um, yeah, it does interest me. But, Chris, you've got my email. Email me. Yeah. Uh, from Rumble. Hey, shout out to everyone on Rumble. We see you. I see you on Rumble. Uh, hey, Dallas 24. Did Alan already win Father of the Year for taking his daughter to the Critics' Choice Awards? Oh, yeah, pretty much. My my daughter considers me uh, the best of her fathers. You're the top. You're the top father yeah. of all her fathers. Of all of them. Yes. So there you go. There you go. All right. Uh, we are going to pivot and get into it. And, and it's just as like the leaf blowers are. I can hear the, the yard people have just showed up. Could not be better timing. Uh, but let's get into it, Alan. Yeah. Let's get into it. I'm looking for something. Yeah, I, I, I don't even... I, I'm the bottleneck here. I, I'm clear. trying to figure out well, which story. I want you to know <laughs> the person that's screwing up right now is the one that's currently talking. But let's get into it. The Critics' Choice Awards took place this past Sunday night. Alan and I are Critics' Choice uh, Association members. We vote in this organization approximately 400 film critics from all over. Um, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get in the organization. I joined, God, maybe a couple decades ago. Honestly, I've been around for a long time, but I haven't really participated um, as much as I have recently. It's a very fun event. It's also very well respected from the standpoint of a lot of the nominees. If you're nominated or win at the Critics' Choice, there's a very good chance you will be nominated and win at the Oscars. 
So it's a very influential uh, organization. Um, it's fun to be a part of. Uh, Alan and I, we're, we're a voting block of two, effectively. Also, I think some of our votes actually diverted, but we were able to attend, and it was a lot of fun. Um, we're going to go through the winners in just a second, but Alan, um, any thoughts on, on the event? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think the strike kind of ruined uh, at least the, the choices that, that I liked. I, I think a lot of films got overlooked, um, you know, just because of this this weird campaigning that the that the studios did. I, for, I mean, I'll, I'll point out American fiction. Um, no one's seen it, uh, but to me, it was the best picture of the year. And uh, and I think the um, I think it's uh, awards run will reflect that. Uh, because it just went national uh, this past weekend, and still no one has seen it. So uh, I, I'm a bit frustrated. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, the, ultimately the winners, I, what, there weren't a whole lot of surprises. And I don't think yeah. uh, there'll be much surprises at the Oscars either. Yeah, not a lot of surprises. I mean, Oppenheimer won for Best Ensemble, whatever that means. Um I think it was also Barbie. I think a lot of people are um, taking the commercial success of Barbie and it's kind of, you know, an award is something that is meant to draw attention to a film, right? Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of an award and it can help movies. This is why we do our own awards event, Award This, which um, if you want to get, if you're an indie filmmaker made a small indie movie, go to awardthis.com and you can actually check out um, what the qualifications are. It's very easy. Basically, you just need a review on Film Threat. You need to be um, commercially available. But let's go through the winners real briefly here before I show you some of the fun videos. Do you want to go bottom up or do you want to? Should I go bottom up? I'll go bottom up. Yeah. This oh, is yeah, that's it's a TV. lot. It's a You're lot. You're going to TV We're right now. Go, just, through. go midway through because that's TV. They, that's they TV and that. we don't care about TV. We're yeah, Film Threat, TV. not TV Threat. But best score... Ludwig Göransson for Oppenheimer. Best original song, I'm Just Ken from Barbie. Best foreign language film. Unfortunately, you know, you and I met the director mm -hmm. of Godzilla Minus One. I did not vote for this movie. I think this movie is overrated. Anatomy of a Fall. Best animated feature, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I did not vote for that. I, I voted did. for The Boy and the Heron. Best comedy, Barbie which they actually presented on camera, which I thought was interesting because they originally weren't going to. Well, uh, let, let's put it this way. Because Barbie won, they presented it on camera. Right. Uh, I think if the others won, they wouldn't have done it. Uh, visual effects, Oppenheimer. And that's interesting that, that it won. I, I think that <laughs> is a statement for best visual effects. Best hair, makeup, Barbie. Best costume design, Barbie. Best editing, Oppenheimer. By hmm. Gen Jennifer Lame. Uh, best production design is Barbie cinematography. That's an easy one. Oppenheimer. Oh, I yeah. voted for that adapted screenplay American fiction by Cord well, Jefferson. Yes. Well-deserved. Well-deserved original screenplay Barbie best director, Christopher Nolan Oppenheimer could not be happier about that. Also best acting ensemble Oppenheimer. It's so funny because every time someone won, for the an award for Oppenheimer, they'd get up on stage and say, "Hey, I want to shout out to my Oppen homies." <laughs> they call themselves Oppen homies. They're Oppen homies. Yes, let's so, make that a thing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the holdovers: best young actor Dominic Sessa, supporting actress Divine Joy Rudolph Randolph. Uh, the holdovers. Yeah, yeah. Supporting actor Robert Downey Jr. Oppenheimer. He also won at the Golden Globes. I think he's going to be on stage at the Oscars. I really do. Mm -hmm. Emma Stone for Poor Things. Best that was actress. the surprise of the night. That was uh, a surprise. Paul Giamatti, Holdovers. That was a surprise. I still think yeah. Killian Murphy may overtake for Oscars. Mm -hmm. And Best Picture, Oppenheimer. Alan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, like I said, uh, not, not a whole lot of surprises. Yeah, the Best Actor, Best Actress, Paul Giamatti, I'm... It's one of those nice surprises. Uh, Emma Stone, uh, not so much. I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't think. Uh, I, I didn't particularly like the movie, and uh, you know, she. <laughs> it's funny in her speech. She talked about she had to unlearn things, and and clearly, what she had to unlearn was acting. <laughs> and, uh, 
and so uh yeah i was i was shocked um you know because if anything if if we're gonna go over the popular route it would have been margot robbie now i was doing the nooner with gary and this piece of you know. crossed my desk we're just going to talk about it very briefly very briefly and i don't think this affects i don't think this affects us but there are two organizations kind of battling it out for mm -hmm. prominence there's the HCA, which is the Hollywood Creatives Association, and the CCA, the Critics' Choice Association. And we, and we should say we know a lot of people in the HCA. We know people in both organizations. And yeah. up until recently, you could be in either. You could be in both. No longer. The Critics' Choice Association sent out word that you may no longer be a part of both. Now, I'm only in one, but I have been recruited by the HCA. The Critics' Choice Award sent out a letter saying, we're sending this email to inform you that the Critics' Choice Association has instituted a new policy prohibiting members of the Hollywood Creative Alliance uh, from maintaining membership in the Critics' Choice Association. If you are currently a member of HCA and CCA, please let us know if you wish to remain a CCA member. This will require confirmation from you that you have successfully resigned from HCA and are no longer on the membership list as posted on its website. They're cracking down. I did not receive this letter because I'm not in yeah. that organization, but I find that really interesting and the timing of that interesting as well. I think that there is a battle for credibility between the CCA and the Hollywood foreign press. Although I'll say this, um, the, the ratings for the golden globes were up by mm. like 50%. The ratings for the Emmys down. It was down by 27%. And last year was the record low ratings. Also record low. I got more stuff to share here. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Alan? Before I Yeah, I, I mean, I've heard rumblings of that in the past. Uh, yeah. And and I also uh, didn't they didn't they say the same thing about the Hollywood Foreign Press Association that we had to you had to choose? Uh, um, no, not about the HFPA, but definitely, um, definitely CCA and HCA, they will no longer be crossover or people in both organizations. Yeah. Do Let's you know have, why is that, is that we're going to talk about next or do you, well, do you know what prompted this? I don't know, but I do know that they're very competitive. The two organizations. I know the guy who runs uh, the HCA, Scott Menzel. Yeah. He is well, really let, let me ask you this. The HCA, yeah. the first word is Hollywood. It, does that imply that all the members are near Hollywood or is it a nationwide organization? Uh, it's it's a nationwide organization, okay. but most of the people are here. Let's have some fun. I'm going to share with you, uh, well, I put this out last night. I know Barbenheimer is a thing, but it always should have been Oppenzilla. It's a picture of Killian Murphy yeah. and the director of Yes. Uh, it directed. Let's not forget one led to the, to the other. Yes. So. Takashi Yamazaki. Yeah. That's a bizarre crossover. But right here are some photos. Hey, look, Alan. Now, this wasn't our table, but we did get some photos near it. I thought it was like, wouldn't it be great if we were at table 69? I thought that would be funny. That's Leonard Malton. He's a giant, really inspired me as uh, covering film. Of course, there's Takashi there. And here we are with the director of Godzilla. That was a lot of fun. And then I just want to let everyone know I'm wearing, I was pulling for Christopher Nolan. I was wearing Batman and not just Batman cufflinks. That's from the dark Knight. So there you go. <laughs> I know you kept telling everybody it's well, not just for Batman. <laughs> Batman logo. It's the Christopher well, it's Nolan. The, Batman. Yes. Okay. All right. I have a, I have some videos that I think I could share. Let me show, let me show two of my pictures real quick. Yeah, then, please. If you could share. So, yeah. um, one of the perks of doing all this is you get to take your daughter to, uh, to these things. Yeah, You took photos of you and your daughter. Yeah. Here, let me, uh, sorry. I need to, I need to get, okay, here we go. You need to prepare uh, for the show. No, no, I did have it and somehow it got switched. So, uh, the big, the big photo get was, uh, my daughter and Tom Hiddleston there. Oh, look at that. Yeah, look at that. She doesn't and look then, happy to be there though. I, well, you know what? This is this is ugly cry. Uh, <laughs> right 
I mean, she was so excited. I mean, you have no idea because uh, this was one of those moments where it just happened to happen and uh, the opportunity was there and we struck. Um, the other thing was we were, uh, unlike you, I was near, I was near the celebrity, the celebrities. And um, I, was, oh, I have a picture of the view. I have a video of the view where I was at. Let me, let me just, we're going to play some of these. Oh, here, let me, let me get this one last. Oh, sure. Here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, um, so just sitting over there, uh, yeah, there was the, you know, my daughter and I favorite movie was American fiction. There was Jeffrey Wright and John Ortiz. Um, and, uh, and I said, do you want to meet them? And she just got up and booked over there. And Commissioner so, Gordon. Commissioner yeah. Gordon. Jeffrey yeah. Jeffrey Wright. Yeah. And, uh, and so there, there was that. And then also there's, there's one photo here that, uh, let me see if I can, this is really, this is the, uh, cool photo um i got it here one second all right this is the cool photo uh see the guy in the blue blazer there yes uh, the guy to the left of the baseball hat yeah uh kevin feige oh, that's kevin feige that's he kevin was there feige. yeah well there you go yeah and then some random asian girl next to me all right right all right <laughs> I'm, we're gonna okay. We're gonna post these videos for members only. I'll I'll post a bunch. I'm gonna just show a few of these videos that we shot while we we're there. I have a lot of videos to post for members only. So um, let's see. This is sort of the outside chaos of what it's like to be there. Okay, here it is. The calm before the storm. The calm before the storm at the Critics Choice Awards. It does get like nuts there and then here we look i'm here with ing the merciless critics choice awards <laughs> we are at the critics choice awards right now it's a packed room of celebrities stars uh free booze um lots of stuff alan and i are getting ready we have our lists we voted alan any thoughts uh everything i voted for won't win I, I, i'm thinking the same yeah, thing yeah pretty much yeah alan is really it must be destiny because we're at the Critics' Choice Awards, which is about to start. And guess what? Sixty-nine. That's the table. <laughs> That's right. Wait, what's this? You gotta, video? you gotta edit those better. Alan and I just saw the biggest celebrity we will see here tonight. That's right. Literally the biggest. Oh, you're not gonna say it. It's Godzilla, people. We 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 met the director of Godzilla minus one. He has a translator who was talking with us. Uh, he was holding a figure of Godzilla. Look, I'm hoping yeah. he wins. Fingers crossed. We're Cannot much... wait. And look who we run into. Hey, look Alan, who we run into. Yeah. Holy cow. There it's she X -ray is. X-Ray girl. Yes, <laughs> X-Ray Oh my God, Kira. Okay, where are you sitting? I have a shit, I have a shit seat. It's fine. Yeah, we okay. all have. All right. I We're wish I had a shit Bye. Bye. So she's going to be back actually for our Oscar, um, our Oscar watch party, which we're going to do, but I want to give you some idea of like where I was sitting. Um, here's what it's like to be in the room, right? Like, well, this was the Ken, the Ken song, but I was kind of like how far back I am. What um, else is here? We're going to talk quickly because we're lonely songwriters. You can watch the show. You can watch the show. This is, I was at table 131. Way in the back. Well, we'll be posting uh, these videos and, and photos and whatnot for members only, uh, which is a lot of fun. So that's basically a reminder to uh, join us as a member. You get access to our Discord and uh, where you can continue the conversation from the chat right on the Discord. There you go. Alan, any final thoughts on the Critics' Choice? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's it was a fun night. Uh, yeah, it, it's... <laughs> oh, I don't want to go into all that. But uh, yeah, we had a... We'll go into all that. Yeah, you know, it's it's just like uh, I I enjoy being part of the uh, the organization, just having a putting my little stamp on on the little things there. And again, everything I voted for lost. So, 
but uh, it's just a chance to meet other critics, uh, hang out with you. Uh, and, uh, you know, there we go. Now we're back to work. It's January. And it it's all starts January. Over there are very few movies worth seeing in theaters in January, but we are going to be covering them on Friday's show. Yeah. I mean, I believe you're gonna you're gonna see the uh, next Oscar Best Picture uh, tomorrow or tonight uh, with the Ava DuVernay movie. I'm seeing Origin, directed by Ava DuVernay. There's a big Oscars push for this. I have thoughts, and I haven't even seen it yet. Yeah, but I mean, it's not an Oscars push because it's out in January. Yeah, it's it's kind of done. Uh, let's go to your chat comments and questions here, starting with Pilgrim Media for two. I watched American fiction, quirky, but good. Well, thank you for that. Jason Webster for 10. Godzilla minus one crosses a hundred million US uh, worldwide, making it the fifth highest worldwide grossing Japanese live action film of all time. It should become the second highest by the end of the week. And also when it's re-released in black and white, I do plan to see it again. Um, so maybe that'll bump it to number one. Yeah. Well, here, here's the thing. Uh, the uh, Godzilla minus one minus color comes out next Friday for one week. And after that one week, uh, Godzilla will be leaving the theaters. Uh, it so will if, not if be you're going to see it. If, if you're going to see it, rush to see it. Immortal Remus for 499 pounds. I saw a meme that might be right, which said poor things and Frankenhooker are essentially the same film. Uh, that is accurate. <laughs> it is. The movie is kind of Frankenstein meets my fair lady, but yeah, it's uh that's really funny that someone pointed that out. I'd yeah, say my guess is poor things had more nudity than Frankenhooker. Yeah. Frankenhooker didn't have as much nudity as one would have expected from director Frank Henenlotter. So I love that movie. Um, and uh, the doctor in it is uh, James Lorenz, who I, I'm a big fan of. Underrated actor. 200 Watt Studio for five says, so cool to see Yamazaki in a pic with Harrison Ford when he was inspired to be a filmmaker from Star Wars. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started following him on, I didn't even know he was on Twitter. Red French Moon became a YouTube member. We thank you for that. And we have a lot of people watching us on Rumble. Aid Ellis24, who did Alan vote for best director? Not Nolan? Did I? Uh, no, actually, I voted for Bradley Cooper. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Starting from the top, we're going to keep going here. Aid Ellis24, did Alan already? Uh, uh, we already oh, yeah, got we that got one. one. Sorry about that. Uh, Good question here. Immortal Remus. I was going to ask what it takes to get into Critics' Choice. Um, here's, here's what I'll say. You need to have a body of work and you need to have been covering film for a certain amount of time. I don't know if they put a number on that, uh, but I do know you've got to have, have a body of work where you can, you can point to it, either write, written or on radio or television or YouTube. And you need to be recommended as a member by another member. So they recruit from within their ranks, right? So uh, I, I've i been a member for, like I said, almost 20 years. I recommended about five years ago or so that Alan be a member. And then he went through the pro – can you talk about the process? Because it's <laughs> been too long for me, Alan. What did, uh, what did, what, what did we do? No, I think it was essentially it was your recommendation, and then me giving them my uh, my uh, my body of work. And there that was, you go. That was pretty much it. Yeah, and the, I think uh, certain things helped the situation. Maybe my background as a as a critic, and as a person having grown up. <laughs> no, I mean because not too long after I got in. Uh, I don't know this for a fact, but, uh, you know, there was that article that came out about Rotten Tomatoes and how white it was. And uh, I think that prompted a lot of organizations to uh, open their their membership up a little bit, you know. Yeah, it's it's really just I really think it's just being consistency. So if you write, mm -hmm. write a review of a movie once a week, that's easy enough to be able to see one film a week that you write a review of. Doesn't have to even be a new film. Um, just. Mm -hmm write reviews or do reviews and consistency is key. Uh, luminous yeah. brilliance says zings by ing. Yeah. Patrick. Well, Lumiere, you know, new people, I, you know, the, the one new members I met, a lot of them came from YouTube. Uh, came from, yeah. Yeah. 
So they are opening their, but you have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. It's really just the thing is just consistency. So if you cover stuff, you cover at least one thing a week. Patrick Lemire says, Ing the Merciless off top rope on Emma Stone. I don't understand that. Off top rope. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm just saying she, I, I didn't, I didn't think she deserved to win, but there you go. All right. Davina Duckworth, American Fish Fiction is based on the 2001 novel Erasure by Percival yeah. Everett. Actually, I started to read it. And uh, surprisingly, a third of the novel is the book of uh, My Pathology. Oh, so it's he actually, yeah, what's he actually wrote, the book he's writing in the book. Yeah. It's, oh, that's it's interesting. Perfect. Yeah. Spidey, Spidey Sensei 72, who's a member for five, says, please Google Peoples Hernandez and tell me if you recognize the actor playing him. Okay, I'm going to do it's that right trap. now. Is this a trap? Could be. <laughs> Is it Polly? Peoples Hernandez. Oh, wow. It's, Je it's Jeffrey Wright. Oh, there you Wait, go. Wait, I mean, oh, it isn't Jeffrey Wright, but it looks exactly like Jeffrey Wright. That is weird. Oh, okay, there we go. Wow. That is striking resemblance. It looks like a young Jeffrey Wright. Wow. Oh, wait. People's Hernandez is Jeffrey Wright. What yeah, it that? is Jeffrey Wright, yeah. I thought People's Hernandez, it's a movie character. All right. There you go. For some reason, Shaft is showing up next to it. <laughs> Thank you, Spidey Sensei. Oh, no, no. Okay. Uh, he plays... Okay, so this is from the movie Shaft, the 2000 film Shaft, and Jeffrey Wright plays the character Peoples Hernandez. JW asks, was Grace Randolph there? No. No. Is she part of the organization? Yes, she is. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, she's in New York and uh, did not leave New York. There you are. Sons and Shadows, who's a member, says, is she going to eat the entire time again? Talking about Molly? Yeah, maybe. Some of the chat comments that are being starred, I don't understand. I, context, I don't understand the context. It needs context. I need context for some of these. But I think they're talking about Molly. Equity Group says, the based brothers infiltrating the Critics' Choice Awards. Here's what I'll say about that. A lot of people came up to us and were, uh, hey, I like what you guys are doing. Not just members of the organization, but people in the industry. Yes. I was surprised how often that happened. So, yeah. There you go. And, and then they'd say, I'm glad it's you and not me. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but no, I don't know. I just like, I don't really, I don't know. I've never really cared. Never really cared. Oh, talking about Kira. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, that's K true. Ray K Ray girl says Faye. They they wouldn't uh, <laughs> they wouldn't give her uh, chicken wings at the event, so she had nope, to but, eat from the charcuterie box. Kira and Sari will be back for our watch party for the Oscars, along with Az Gary from Nerdrotic, Polly Latino Slant. We'll probably just do the same people, yeah. maybe and, and Dante. I think we'll just do the same people, right? Yeah. For the Oscars, we have a limit of ten, so. So yeah. there's room for and, one or two more. And by the way, this upcoming Tuesday, Tuesday, January 23rd, Alan and I are getting up at 4.30 a.m. We will be live streaming the announcement of the Oscar nominees. We're going to put it in one screen so you can watch with us. We, are, we will be able to share it from Oscars.com. We'll just share the feed from that and we'll yeah. go through all the nominees. So we're going to be, are you ready to get up? I think they start announcing at 5.30 a.m. So we'll start the stream around five. Yeah, well, it's simulcast on Good Morning America. So, uh, I mean, I could I could do the sheet thing with this thing again. Do the sheet thing, know. but then we. I think we could just share a screen. It's supposed to be a public feed. Is it? Okay. Me and my monkey says the two of you are awesome reporters. Ah, oh, well, thank you for that. <laughs> we're not, but yeah, thanks. <laughs> And Red French Moon says, yes, so cool. The same people, you all have a great chemistry. Yeah, we'll have the same people for the Oscars. And we'll be, um, you know, we'll, we're just going to have fun. We're just going to, I used to love watching the Oscars. It's not as fun as it used to be. Used to be. 
Um, you and me and the movies as a Godzilla fan, I recommend you finish Monarch Legacy of Monsters. The last half of the season is pretty darn good. I watched the first five episodes and was really just bored. Um, unfortunately, well, maybe Godzilla I, shows up in the last half. I did see a clip that leaked on YouTube that it looks like Godzilla does show up, but um, it I don't know. I, I just not super loving it. Hey, lover of green for 10. In today's Nooner, you reveal the WGA's adherence to DEI. How come no one has sued them yet? Affirmative action was unalived by the Supreme Court. Will anyone battle Hollywood DEI in the same way? I'll tell you why that that's not going to happen. Because everyone in Hollywood lives in fear. And mm -hmm. if you attack DEI, you are a racist. And you are a person who will no longer be hired in Hollywood if you do that. And that is why that won't happen. Yeah, I mean, if you I'm read the, if you read the negative comments, uh, it's all uh, oh, this is from a mopey white guy who's been in the industry for decades uh, and can't can't give it give up his control. Uh, we're talking about the comments on the article. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. So there are positive comments also, but yes. people are battling it out. Um, we're not going to talk about this this week, but before we get to the D files, I do want to share. Um, I'm going to share screen on something that is in the works and will more than likely be out next week. Um, let me find it. Give me a second. Uh, here we go. Okay. Wait here. here okay. Here. Read more. Okay. I know how to, I know how to website works. <laughs> uh, thank you. Lover of green. That's very generous. We appreciate all your super chat here, but here we go. Um, in our story, this, and I'm going to undo this in our story, a veteran screenwriters plot twist on Hollywood's DEI cultural shift. Uh, we talked about, uh, this is written by a WGA member who's been a member for decades. And it's an open letter from a white writer to the film and TV business about how the industry has changed. We have too many ads on the website. I, this is annoying. Yeah. Click one or two. And then I just, I'm annoyed by, I'm annoyed by my own website. Anyways, no, no. um, you're talking about a lot of the comments here in the chat. You, you're, Welcome to go to the story and read the comments. Um, and look, here's a story says facts matter. This is garbage. Look at the data. It shows that there has not been an increase in hiring non-white men in writing and directing. Look at the top 100 films in the U S how many of those films were written and or directed by white men. The majority it's interesting to see that no one demands the facts be presented to justify a position. Exactly, Molly. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's just it's just reposting that same yeah. link. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is about that it. link. I looked at that link. It's talking about film, and uh, the majority of what the the writer is is referring to is television. It's almost yeah. impossible to get into television. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you know there is a difference there, and and to say that that this doesn't exist and only point to film says that uh, you need to do more research. Where you're well, you're welcome to post your own comment. I'll I'll just yeah. say this: uh, we will be doing a follow up story based on other letters that we've received from people. We will be doing a follow up story, so stay tuned for that. But we've got to get right into it. Um, any other comments on this before I move on? Let me. Uh, no, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is interesting, and uh, and I do appreciate the the comments that have been coming in ever since. MK solid 82 for one nine nine says, why wasn't Chris Stuckman an award presenter? I don't believe he's part of the organization. Also, they don't for the critics choice awards. They have, I mean, it's a show they get people to yeah. present that are celebrities. This isn't award. This <laughs> where Alan and I do that. Uh, let's see another chat here. I'm sorry I came on a few days ago and lashed out. I thought this was a mainstream media review channel. I'm just as upset with the message and 
Hollywood has done. I'm you guys rock says Lori J for $13.99 Canadian, which is I think $5. <laughs> With how the uh is that a subtle dig is. there is <laughs> subtle dig at Canada. I'm gonna dig at Canada. I'm not a fan of Justin Trudeau. I think he's running that country oh, into yeah. the ground. I think I think um I'm not a fan of Justin Trudeau. He's divisive and um I think he's a hypocrite. And I I I feel sorry for Canadians that have not awakened to the fact that um the country is objectively worse under his leadership than before. I'm looking for confirmation from his peacock. Yes. Here we go. Not Equity getting. Group says uh, Trudeau blocked all news in Canada. Is that true? It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. But I don't know worry, that he, it's not like a blanket blocked it all, but uh, you know, his 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 fangs are in the in the news media in Canada for sure. Lori J, by the way, just to let you know, we're a channel that welcomes other opinions. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the Film Threat website, I, mean, I read reviews on filmthreat.com that I don't agree with because our writers are uh are very have diver diverse opinions. I'll say this. Donk is with me as a Canadian. I 100% agree with Chris. Yeah. By and the way, it looks like, oh no, read this one. Yeah. Lod 689 says, since Canadians ha have, haven't been truly free since he was put in office. Yeah. Hate to say that. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, you know, speaking of not agreeing with uh, our writers, we're about to give, she is Conan. I believe it's going to be a 10 out of 10, if not a nine. Who <laughs> so, wrote the review? Michael. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, yeah, Look, yeah. I love, I mean, Alan and I, I, we cross over actually more than you would think. Yeah. I'd say we're about 50-50. I'd say about 50% of the time we're in agreement. The other 50% of the time we're obviously not in agreement. So what can you say? Um, but yeah, true, true. I'm just seeing all this negative stuff on Trudeau in the chat, which I love. I mean, he looks up to she. Um, says one punch man Tolkien fan, and yet y'all still vote for Castro him. <laughs> in the French spelling. Castro, oh, this is someone, uh, god, I missed it. Canadian filmmaker, did I miss someone? Says, I'm a Canadian. This, uh, from Daniel Geese says, Trudeau is elite's garbage. I am the Canadian filmmaker. That's uh, that's my Canadian <laughs> French accent. How did I do, Miss Peacoffee? Well, thumbs up, thumbs up, no, yeah, thumbs down. She's giving me a <laughs> thumbs down for my performance. I don't know, French Canadian, terrible, terrible. <laughs> Question for Alan: Where did the ousted animators go to after Disney went full woke? Yeah, you know what? Uh, Let's, should we I, save I it? I, I have to. I have to consider how to answer this question. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, no, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. Let, let's yeah. wait until we get to that story. Sure, We're going to pivot in just a minute. Yeah, say um, that question. Honk, honk, bonk. Invade Canada, Operation Maple Freedom. <laughs> yeah, we, I, didn't, well, didn't we invade another country? Uh, that one didn't turn out so well. Uh, well, when we invade countries, look, when America <laughs> invades countries, there's no ulterior motive. <laughs> yeah. that It's for freedom, people. <laughs> it's yeah, we don't have any. America doesn't have ulterior motives for invading countries. It's never that. All right, let's not get political. <laughs> Enough with that. Um, we got movies to talk about, but let's do this, Alan. It's time. Oh, we doing it? Well, I do have a complaint. I was talking to you before uh, the stream. I have a comp. I have a. I have a bone to pick with you. Here, wait. I'm, I got. I got to get all this stuff together here. Sorry, Alan. Okay. Well, super chat just came in. Uh, Let's do that real quick. Here, uh, T Neil eighty nine, aka dislikes puns for five dollars. None of my business, but is ing short for when, Alan? And is that an obvious joke that's gone over my head until now? <clears throat> no, no. Actually, uh, the, the the funny story is is when I went to college. Uh, I'd go into class, uh, went to Cal State LA. Um, 
a lot of Asians there. And so uh, in class, they would go down the, the roster and they'd get to my name. They'd say, Alan, uh, how do you pronounce your name? And I would say, <laughs> it's, it's, I'd say it's Ing. Okay, Alan Ing. Very good. Okay, then they go to the next person. Okay, Tran Ing Yuyen. And then all the, <laughs> all the Vietnamese people would then hate me <laughs> at that moment. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's. Yeah, what can you do? You're, you're stuck with your name, the last one anyway. Oh, my God. Um, here we go from Chris Michael. We're going to pivot. Chris Michael, I've been browsing online greater than three hours today. Still, I never found interesting articles like yours. It's good value, sufficient for me. Well, thank you. Yeah. Go to filmthread.com. You can spamming that comment. Uh... Yeah, there you go. All right, it's time. The D Files Part 2 is here. This is the second in the series of stories written by Mr. Alan Ng, who is the editor-in-chief of Film Threat, emblazoned on the front page of Film Threat right now. The D-Files Part 2, The Great Mouse Reset. We're going to go over this story in just a second. I just first must complain to Alan, you need a different graphic. You can brand the story, just something slightly different graphic every time. Okay. You can tell them apart. Yeah, all right. I'm sure the writing. Oh, yeah, is there's, there's, there's a, uh, yeah, we, we we've just started investigative journalism, and uh, so there are things that kind of take a backseat, and clearly it's the header graphic image. And to be clear, how this started, if you're just catching up, Alan did a review of Disney's Wish, which is a movie that was released um, on the hundredth anniversary of the Walt Disney Company. That is, in Alan's words. Uh, I'm quoting Alan Ng, the worst animated Disney film ever made. Uh, after in, that, in Disney's history. Let's... In Disney's history. And after that comment, uh, after that comment went around and Alan's review was passed around between animators, which then evolved into a discussion where animators were reaching out to both Alan and I about the rot at Disney. Mm -hmm. the activist rot that is destroying the company through um, overt messaging, through just the decline in quality and a, 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 a literal overthrow of the veteran talent at the company. This is part two of the story. Would mm -hmm. you like to read it, Alan, or should I? Um, why don't you read it since you're controlling it there? Okay. Let's start, uh, and, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but we will put a link in the description to the story. And here we go. As exposed in part one of the D-Files, the removal of John Lasseter was never about removing a, quote, bad man. But more than his personal demons, but more that his personal demons were used as an excuse slash weapon to remove him from creative power at the Walt Disney Company. The next step should have been to replace Lassiter with someone equally talented as him. Instead, the sinister voice forces within Disney saw his firing as a chance to initiate Disney's great reset. So there you go. My apologies for all the ads. It's how we pay <laughs> the people. So I'm going to scroll past them as quickly as I can. Um, it was October 2018, and Lasseter's last Disney film, Raya and the Last Dragon, was still in the early stages of development and storyboarding. His fingerprints were all over this project. The initial directors were Paul Briggs and Dean Wellens, with Adele Lim coming off her success with Crazy Rich Asians as the sole writer. Unfortunately, this trio was seen as being Lasseter people. Briggs and Wellens needed to go as they didn't fit the correct demographic, or maybe they were Lasseter loyalists to tell Raya's story properly. Rumor has it that Lee was gunning for Briggs and Wellens by foisting impossible tasks on them to either get them to get them fired or better yet, force them to quit. Being the veteran talent that they were, the traps didn't work. Briggs was demoted to co-director and Wellens was given a Disney Plus series to direct. Disney did have a diversity problem within animation, prompting Jennifer Lee to recruit new talent from the outside. Lee brought in Carlos Lopez Estrada to direct. The Mexican-American, not Southeast Asian director, not Southeast Asian director, was coming off his DGA nomination for his first feature, Blind Spotting. Before that, Estrada was an experimental theater director who worked his way into directing music videos 
and commercials. Yeah. So so they brought in a, an inexperienced talent who who was a known name at that time uh, for blind spotting. Estrada was the emerging director needed to bring a fresh perspective to Disney animation. The problem is that directing animation is different from directing live action features. His inexperience quickly showed and veteran director Don Hall was brought in to give the fresh face on the job training. Raya and the Last Dragon was Asada, Estrada's first and last Disney project as he would return to directing music videos. The other curious move by Jennifer Lee had to do with writer Adele Lim. I'm just speculating here, but was Lim now being targeted by Lee because she was a Lassiter hire? What was the reason behind reason for bringing in a second writer? Lim was now forced to share writer credit with Lee's new recruit, Q Wen. See, I got that right. Whose credits to this point were a handful of television episodes as a writer, but mostly staff writer credits. The addition of Wen begs the question, why would Lim, coming off a $239 million success with Crazy Rich Asians, need to share a writing credit and paycheck with a relatively inexperienced TV writer? In my humble opinion, Disney decided to take a talented and studio-proven Asian woman and reduce her to a mere diversity hire. After Raya and the Last Dragon, Lim left Disney to write and direct her feature films, including Joyride. Her co-writer, Hui Wen, went on to direct and co-write the 2022 Disney flop, Strange World. And this is under the heading, Women in Animation. From here, Raya and the Last Dragon turned from a traditional Disney animated production to slowly transforming into Disney's first DEI test case. Step one was to load the entire project with female South Asian animators and talent from within the company. Then female Asian animators, then female POC animators and the rest. But that wasn't enough. Rather than pull in other artists from within, a major recruitment push was made to hire more women from outside the company to reach a 50-50 male-female balance for equity's sake. A concerted effort was made to think outside the box recruiting at Disney during the female leads uh, filmmaker panel for Ryan. Oh, so you could, you could skip to the next paragraph, but the important thing was there. It was that Disney had to move outside the box. Yeah. It, and uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, go to that. Disney animation did go out. Disney animation did go out of its norms in hiring with the help of WIA women in animation an advocacy group created in 1993. Their mission states, we envision a world in which people of all gender identities share fully in the creation, production, and rewards of animation. With Raya and the Last Dragon, that aggressive push for gender e equity and to radically transform an industry starts now. Sources tell us that with Raya and the Last Dragon, the goal wasn't to bring diversity, equity, and inclusion into the existing community of Disney animators, to, but to replace it with a radicalized group of female activists completely. One female POC animator contacted us about her experience with WIA to further her career in animation. She was looking for mentorship and resources to break into the industry. While initial discussions were cordial, she was quickly ghosted by the organization because she did not live in Los Angeles and could not be helpful to their cause. Uh, so there you go. Our source yeah. also us that once she expressed concerns about the mission of WIA, she found herself blacklisted from the industry, a prevalent story we've heard, and felt that WIA and similar organizations had become the gatekeepers for women to an enter animation. It's not enough as an animator to be ta a talented female person of color. You have to be WIA approved and toe the line. Does that mean about... Um, I know what you mean by this. Another example of this new activist culture is the formation of a segregated women's committee that meets regularly to pitch ideas, network, vent, look at story room strategies, listen to guest speakers, and empower each other to take on leadership roles. Many of these sessions are sponsored by WIA and strictly for female identifying and non-binary people. Can you imagine going into a creative meeting knowing that half the room has already made all the decisions beforehand. These meetings are literal war rooms as so-called creative sessions are now considered battlefields. Now imagine if you disagreed with one of their ideas. Shots fired. I'm sure there's a large bag of ists 
nearby to hurl your way. Yeah, we could probably Under end that. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's there's more to the article um, in this. It's sort of broken up into three parts. Uh, there is a, it's supposed to be in italics at the end. Oh, yeah. If you are a Disney cast member, particularly in animation, who has been walking on eggshells, please, eggshells is cap. Why is eggshells cap? I, this was a last minute ad. And I, yeah. Please reach out to us on or off the record. We want to tell your story. Contact us here. Well, there you go. Uh, you can finish reading the article. What I want to know is, Alan, what are your thoughts? What are my thoughts? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's all pretty much there. It, it, you know, this this right here just sets the stage that um, it, equity is uh, <laughs> equity. Equality used to be the goal uh, at, at in, in every industry, you know, in, in these, you know, culturally white dominated industries. Uh, and as a, as the minority poll. Pop, minority populations of America grew, it was time to bring in people of color, um, you know, people, minorities. I, I hate that color. M minorities is the word I tend to use. And uh, and it was, you know, being able to train, to mentor, and to uh, to get people up to speed as to how to do things well. Uh, but now it becomes, now it's become a political movement where uh, it's, it's not so much, you know, people wanting to tell their stories or wanting to show their artistic talents, it, it now becomes this movement to, to run things. And, uh, and we're going to show later on in, the, in further, uh, further parts of uh, the defiles that, uh, that basically this, this idea of, um, of basically infiltrating uh, the animation industry is, is pretty much a cancer that is not only spread within animation, but within practically every other department uh, at Disney. And and you see the result of it. Uh, like cancer, the company is slowly dying. And uh, you know, and this is this is just a sad thing. And and you know, the reality is is there are women who who are talented artists. There were women who are working at Disney at that time who could have been easily promoted, uh, easily brought in. And uh, and what happened was basically, you know, if you read a little more into the details of the article, you know. They started loading up Raya with all these female animators, a lot of them untested, untrained, and they all floundered. And because mm -hmm. the veteran talents were also trying to work on this project, there was no mentorship. And heaven forbid you should allow one of the male veteran animators mentor uh, mentor the, the new talent. And this is the beginnings of the mess you're finding that Disney find itself in. Yeah, it's... um. I mean, it's going to contain, I think this could evolve potentially into a book for you, Alan, um, at some point. We'll talk about that offline, but I, I see this running at least the next couple months um, just to bring us up to present day. And um, I'm just surprised there's not more of an industry reaction. I know there is in the animation community, there's a reaction to all of this. But when it comes to the mainstream trade publications, they virtually ignored the ill effects of DEI. We're seeing it in other parts though. We're seeing well, I mean, the WGA article we're running uh, reflects this as well. Right. Well, we're, and, and, and we'll get more into that, but now there are other industries that are being affected where, I mean, it's one thing, Hey, a bad movie. Okay, fine. A bad movie, our entertainment going away. Okay. We'll survive that. We'll just look for other things. You know, my two favorite movies of the last two years were not American films. RRR last year, mm -hmm. well, previous two years ago, and last year, Godzilla minus one. So I guess we look for entertainment other places, but it's really disconcerting when you see industries, for example, like the airline industry, the food industry. I mean, there's almost like post pandemic, there's been sort of a general decline in the quality of almost everything across the board. So the service industry for sure. Um, it's just, you know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I never noticed it. Cause it's just like, oh, you generally good, good customer service. Now it's yeah. just in everything. It's really in everything. And so we shouldn't be surprised at this, this um, on these progressive companies that have leaned heavily into this, that it should affect the final product. Um, I think this is, yeah. this is more more the focus of the WGA article, which is still on the 
obviously it's all still on the website, you know, it's archive all our stories, but um, that really exposed that there was a change in thinking of even what kinds of projects got developed. We will be doing a follow-up to the WGA story where we learned, we just got an email from a guy, this is like two days ago, who said that in development across TV and film, there's a phrase that they use called male and pale is stale. That is a real thing that people who work in entertainment say. How is that not just straight up racist? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because it uh, it completely disregards talent. Uh, it, it completely disregards a working model. The, the fact that phases one and two, phases one through three of the MCU uh, was was basically uh, excellence and quality. Uh, and, uh, you know, and heaven forbid you should repeat, repeat that. And now you, now we're moving into this DEI realm, you know, where, where, you know, where, where, I don't know, there's this belief that, you know, I go to my daughter and say, Hey, there's Asians in this movie. We need to see it. Cause it's going to be great. You know, you'll see yourself in that story uh, and realize that, uh, as much as we'd like uh, to see Asians represented in films, uh, they're not being placed in very good stories. And, uh, and we go back to the white ones. Well, I'll just say, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll say this. I think there's a very bad idea that has been pushed that people need to push back against. And that is this, that you need to see, it's a narcissistic view of the world. I need to see myself in this movie. No, you don't. If you tell a good story, you will identify with the story of the protagonist in a movie, regardless of what you look like. And the entire point of all fiction, whether it is a movie, a video game, uh, a book, is that you, I, you see yourself in the lead character. The lead character might be a pig in Charlotte's web might be um, not even a human or a cartoon character. It doesn't matter. This idea, which has been pushed mainly in colleges that, that uh, you need to see yourself. You actually don't need to see yourself. You identify, you can identify with a protagonist that doesn't look like you. It's an opportunity to learn empathy. That's the point of all storytelling is to, to, is to in yourself build an empathy for someone who does not look like you. And we'll end it there. Part three of the D files will be coming in the next week or so. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to talk about, I have some stories about just the environment that this has created this, this idea that, uh, that uh, you're, you're constantly walking on eggshells that if you don't watch what you say, uh, if you don't watch, uh, you know, if, if you if you're constantly censoring yourself that you're going to get shipped off to uh, HR, uh, you know, we ha we have a few stories. But uh, if you if you've experienced this at Disney, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to uh, get you in on this. All right. We're going to stay on top of this as it evolves. Yeah. Let's go to your chat comments and questions, starting with the super chat here from Thomas Pickett for 10. Equality sounds good, but when you really think about it, it isn't. It is Kurt Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron. Bergeron, it destroys anything special about humanity. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comment, Thomas. Uh, let's keep going here. Question for Alan. Ready, Alan? Yes. Okay, I have a good answer for this one now. Where did the ousted animators go after Disney went fully woke? Went fully okay. woke. Yeah, so the sound that uh, from, uh, let's see, the best way to say it is, is that, uh, you know, animation, If to be an animator for a lot of people was was a dream to work for Disney. Uh, it was a dream for work, working in the industry as an animator for, uh, for artists was the dream. And the problem now is that the environment uh, at not only Disney, but at the others, have got has gotten so toxic that the dream has become soured, and I will tell you the vast majority of people uh, a realize this and won't go in the industry, 
uh, and uh, a lot of the veterans have decided to retire. Um, a while ago, there were some uh, Disney veteran uh, animators that I've mentioned. And um, while I was wrong in my assumptions about why they left, uh, my feeling is, is that they may have seen the writing on the wall as to mm. the direction of this industry and decide to cash out and uh, and leave and live a relatively stress-free life. Um, you know, it, it, th this is the sad thing because, you know, as young people, uh, young people who want to become artists, they spend their lives learning about art. And then they, when they finally get into an industry that allows them to do what they do, they find out it's a toxic environment uh, and, and that they're more concerned about their jobs than they are about the art they're creating. And again, this, this, uh, this is not just animation. This happens everywhere. I can tell you teaching is the same way. Uh, education. You know, mm. how many people do I know who who wanted to go into the noble profession of teaching? And then once they got there, experienced the the bullying of administrators and the this attitude that that actually educating our children is not the priority. Uh, it's it's maintaining the strength and power of its union. Uh, that drove a lot of my friends out of education where they could have been you know they were good they were good people i'm i'm pretty sure that they would have loved to have shaped and molded the minds of of the young people of, of our children mm -hmm. and uh and they gave up on that dream and think about all the other people that they're they're you know who go into these industries with dreams and then have them soured and this is the sad state of where entertainment is today wow let's uh more comments here from people Davina Duckworth says, can you imagine seeing your life's work destroyed by activists? Mm -hmm. Terrible. That's exactly what's going on. Yep. An hey, entire, you know, Walt Disney's legacy is being torn apart at this moment. Yeah. Hey, it's me in HD, who's a member, says, geez, the rot really goes deep. Mm -hmm. Alan Horkin says, this is why freedom of association, including freedom to not be in any union, is unfortunately necessary. Mm -hmm. Kronos Godwisen. So if nine out of the 10 candidates are men, hire the one at all costs. Yeah. Uh, Mars Monkey Max says, aha, have you all ever seen a company waste so much money? That's why these <laughs> movies cost so much. It's really like someone even said in one of the other correspondences said there is what they call middle management bloat. There are a lot of people who spend most of their time justifying their jobs. This is what happens, Larry, as a comment. Mm -hmm. When reaching certain metrics becomes the goal, it defeats the purpose of the metrics. Yep. yep. Beerosaurus Rex, always love that name, who's a member, says, looking up the filmography of these people, it's crazy how rapidly the newer ones were advanced. Instead of decades on animated features, they have very little relevant at all, if anything. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine if they got, uh, let's say, a woman of color who who wrote for a cartoon series and then gave her a superhero series to run? I mean, that would seem uh, insane to do, but uh, thankfully, Disney had never done that. Right. Uh, Aaron Taylor says, the worst is BIPOC, which is popular in Canada. Black, Indigenous people of color, basically a ranking system, black mm -hmm. indigenous and everybody else. It's so disingenuous. It's performative. Yeah. Red French moon says it trickles in all the Western media. It's infuriating because there were always some social commentary in art, but they shift gears and it's indoctrination now and quality drops. Also. Yeah. And that's why, that's why, you know, RRR and Godzilla minus one, you know, why we, respond to those movies so much more than anything we put out. Uh, I, I just remember watching uh, Godzilla minus one and thinking, boy, uh, you know, American movies suck. And it sucks. <laughs> <hard>. <laughs> um, Thomas Pickett back again for five activists never create anything. They get put in positions of power and then destroy the business. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. I don't think there's a look. The thing is this, like, when you see so much of this stuff, it's like, well, what did you create? If, if it, It's like an antagonist art movement of being anti a thing. But once the anti thing is gone and you've destroyed it, what it, what can you create in its place? Yeah. Well, we, what are you going to create? Yeah, it was brought up in the, in the WGA letter 
Uh, yeah. You know, there were young writers who, after two years, were frustrated that they were no that they weren't showrunners yet. Two years, which tells me is that they were more concerned about running a TV show than they were about writing a TV show. You know, it was kind of like, you know, it's that feeling of, uh, hey, I got I put my two years in of doing the stupid writing thing. Now, now put me in charge, which tells me they're not really writers. You know. Ing. Ing H21 became a YouTube <laughs> member. Well, thank you for that. Join us on the Discord. Uh, Sons and Shadows says DEI Klein decline. Thank you, Sons and Shadows. Um, Davina Duckworth, equality is too difficult. They've shifted to equity now. Yeah. They, well, it's it, equality takes time. Uh, and it wasn't it wasn't moving fast enough. But, but I would I would argue equality was here. Uh, to me, the definition of equality was equal access to opportunities. And uh, in the 80s, I could tell you it, it was very difficult for me as an Asian to, to get the jobs I got. And I had to work hard and prove that, you know, I deserved to be in the room. Um, you know, and then, you know, and then move to today, uh, so much easier for anybody to get almost any kind of a job. Yeah, uh, That's, we, you know, Someone, someone who recently dropped out of the presidential race said that this is the closest we've ever been to true equality, and and we're allowing uh, DEI, we're allowing CRT to to be the roadblock to finally coming through and and crossing the finish line. But I read an article. I think the person you're talking about. Um, I read an article. I think it was Babylon Bees working at a Seven Eleven now. Yeah, everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, people got mad at that joke. It's of course stupid. they did. Because no one has a sense of humor anymore. No one has a sense of you need if you can have a sense of humor about yourself, that says a lot. Yeah. And that's why I don't even think I can work with anyone who doesn't have a sense of humor about themselves. I just can't, I don't know how to I don't know how to be in a room with you. You know, you yeah. gotta have a sense of humor. I mean, how dare Joe Coy make a joke about Taylor Swift? Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. What can you say? Ramina Jones, good to see you here. In my work, I had a male mentor who was excellent and really started me off well. Imagine if I were to reject him for being a white man. Mm -hmm. Well, that is what is being taught here. It's very anti-white male. I mean, frankly, I haven't gone to Sundance since 2018. I don't feel I'm welcome there. I never thought I'd even say those words. Sundance has always been diverse, but now it's against a certain type of person. Never saw that one coming. And it feels weird um, that it, it feels weird that now we're at a place where like, I'm sitting here going like, I wonder if someone will dislike me based on who I am. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird how they've just replaced old racism with new. I thought in the nineties we were like getting to a place where it's like, yay, we're colorblind. Isn't that what we've been trying to do for decades? Yeah. And all of well, that color blind is a racist term now. F that. I, I I I that's the thing is I don't I don't get this whole I just don't understand this yeah. thinking. Well, it's it's the whole acknowledge my race, but don't acknowledge my race. It's a bunch of rules that from what I can see are all being made up on the fly just to make you wrong. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, I'm making up the rules, you're wrong about everything. Yeah. Well, I've always said equality today is now about revenge. You know, you, you know, now that we're getting close to being equal, it's time for you to step aside, you know, and let us take over, you know, and, and that's exactly what's happening uh, at Disney here. You know, I, I've, you know, some of the people who reach out basically said that uh, they're on a holding pattern at Disney, that they're not being allowed, that they're not being uh, brought on to new projects. Uh, and then also, and then when they finally do get on a new project, uh, when they go when they go down the list of scenes to do, of course, uh, you know they're pushed down to the more mundane, boring scenes. Mm. You know, the, these people with with decades of talent are now doing background work uh, because because somehow uh, you know only women and women of the color of the characters on the scene can animate those and get the true. You know, the true reactions, the two true movements of those people. 
Uh, it's it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, I I'd seen that. They, this, Walt Disney had gotten it wrong for a hundred years. I mean, if anything, anyone that's an animator understands that part of animation is acting. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been to an animation studio, and I've been to several, they all have mirrors. Yeah. Because they're doing expressions, hand movements. They all use their own face. It's acting. Yeah. Um, the idea that you must look like the character that you're animating is another dumb idea. I just think there's got to be a pushback again. I don't know. I, look, I just think the industry is going to become less and less relevant. It's going to contract and shrink. When you look at the box office for Wish, didn't even crack 100 mil. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the current box office is. Maybe you look that up. Um, yeah. You should look it up. But um, I just think that audiences are going to, to reject it. I, I think ultimately this. Do you want progress or revenge? I, I actually want progress. Mm -hmm. I want other stories. And you look at other stories. I think was it you that tweeted out, Alan? It was like a it was like a montage of Disney princesses. Yeah. And they none of them were white. And they all for, were like from like 10 more than 10 years ago. Yeah. And they I were mean, all they were all successes. And they were all successes. Exactly. But it's like they have a lot of characters that aren't white it's weird hey thomas pickett is back yeah. for five says revenge is a dish best served by a lesbian black woman in a wheelchair yeah. you, made me say that. <laughs> you made me say that <laughs> thank you thomas pickett <laughs> okay that's weird Lori orman <laughs> member for 10 months says i was told at a previous employer to not complain because i'm white Everything is easy for me. Uh, yeah, yeah I mean, it's. Um, I would tell that person to go fuck themselves. I mean, I would quit. Is what that? I mean, I look. I'm in a fortunate position. Um, I have a small business. Alan is part of that business. I mean, but Alan and I joke with each other all the time. I, I you know. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. I feel like we have a relationship where we can joke with each other where I, I wouldn't even like, I don't know. It just is weird. I would feel weird saying that not yeah. complain because you're white, man, Lori. That's I, I hope you, uh, well, you're no longer there previous employer, but wow. I hope that company goes out of business. Yeah. And Chris, you're and, the best white boss I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> so you've had better bosses. than we Hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> Alan rarely ever compliments me. Like almost never. He doesn't need, I don't need it. I don't care. Well, okay. But of I'll, all the white people I know, you're the best. <laughs> what? Oh, I'm sorry. My wife. I'm sorry. Of all the white people I know, you're my second favorite. Uh, Cause my, yeah, wife, I'll take my it. wife comes first. And, uh, well, there you, that's, well, that's the way it should be. <laughs> you are my I, favorite. I don't take offense at that at all. You're my Thank favorite. You, Lori. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Lori. And shout out to Lori Ormond. If you are looking for someone to create your Shopify shop, Lori redesigned her shop, put it all together. Reach out to Lori Ormond. She's in the chat right now. If you're looking to have a Shopify revamped or created for your business, reach out to Lori. Okay. So there you go. Um, hire her to diversify your business. Or yeah. whatever what, one thing i'll say in also regards, she's so, very good at her job yeah. yes sorry yeah, yeah yeah one thing i'll say in regard to the the current topic at hand is uh i think the the impression i'm getting is that uh the executives are getting kind of tired of all this oh uh, yeah now i i'm digging i'm digging and i'm trying to hopefully get enough to where i could actually speak with some kind of authority without guessing but the the impression is, is that, uh, um, yeah, that uh, this is, you know, they're, they're not blind to this. Uh, they they right. know the problem. They just kind of they're either right now uh, have been so beaten and battered, or two something's going to happen. And and I'm afraid when it comes to the animation industry, uh, the the ramifications of this and the decisions the executives are going to make is going to fundamentally change the animation industry. Hmm. Interesting.
Yeah. And, All and, right. you, and, and you pretty much know the direction they're going to go in. Uh, oh. it, it'll be overseas and AI. All right. Uh, we have more chat questions. We're going to get through these. And then we have a quick topic sort of introducing our Sundance coverage. A lot going on. The old boys network was replaced with an old cows network. says Protos <laughs> Godwisen. Yowzer, 79. More about hunting new job titles than creating a quality body of work. Power is desired more than great art. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the perfect point. It's uh, the it's it's the chase for titles. Uh, people people don't care about doing the work. They want that title because that title will get them the next job. The Drifter 67 says the audience needs to be the cure by not facilitating this crap with our money. Ron Doucet, having worked in TV animation for over 20 years and remotely for Disney productions off and on, I've heard from artists there for the past few years how much it's been challenging to work there. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. From Rumble, Nick Gurr, middle management needs to be replaced by AI. Don't even need a complex algorithm. Yeah, who's now, that again? Who? From Nick Gurr. Oh. Dang it. <laughs> I just need to let Bethel Games know. Alan makes fun of me all the time. His jokes are kind of under the radar. They're like, Alan does what I call, this is what Alan does. Once I point it out, you can't not notice it. Alan throws joke grenades. He throws these little joke grenades and he just sort of waits for them to go off. And I'm the victim every time. Red French Moon says, absolutely, Alan, we're going backwards. When we were so close to the finish line, it's the same in France. Instead of moving forward, we are DEI too. Yeah, let's let's I, let's face it. There's an entire industry built on DEI, on CRT, and they're making oh. millions. They're rolling in money. Oh. Uh, we call them grifters. They are grifters. We know the name and the company of the DEI company that's done a lot of the, the, the stuff, the work at um, mm -hmm. Disney. And, uh, we're and, gonna and many to, other corporations. And we're going to point to that person's website. So, uh, because there's a really interesting story about that person that's in an upcoming story. Matt says, equity is a pipe dream and has been tried many times before to disastrous results. All you need to do is look at Mao's China and the results mm -hmm. of the Cultural Revolution. Yeah. Bethel I mean, Games, that's, that was, that's why it's called the Cultural Revolution. Uh, yeah. They... It was the takeover of culture, and that's what's exactly what's going on today. Bethel Games says Chris is saying that he and Alan are joking at each other, but I only see Chris making jokes about Alan. <laughs> Alan I like makes jokes think, about me. I, I like to think sarcasm is a joke. Sarcasm, yeah. The form uh, Nicholas Fargo for four nine nine. Wish has grossed two hundred and twenty four million worldwide, only sixty three million from the U.S. alone. Simply pitiful. By the way, great to see you at the Astros two weeks ago, Chris. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, the Astras Awards, that's the, the HCA organization. A lot of fun, that organization. Yeah, I might have had one too many margaritas. Not going to lie about that. That was fun. But uh, we're going we're gonna to leave it there for this story. It's um, uh, continuing. And we're going to, part three is going to be coming out. And I, I'm really interested when you get to the point where you're going to tell the story about the DEI person that came in and was giving the animators tips and mm -hmm. telling them the movies that were bad. Yeah. You know which story I'm talking about? Yeah, I know what story you're talking Because about. we know who that person is. Yeah. A lot more. These stories are going to continue to um, reveal information. And just a quick plug. Uh, thank you, Scott McKenzie. Member for 15 months says, hey, Alan, Chris, the D files are excellent. Thank you, Alan. Well, thank you hey, for being welcome. a member. I, I, it, it's it, The heat is going to be turned up. Alan yeah. is going to be on two shows, I believe, tomorrow. Can you yeah, I'll be on that, with the uh, I'll be on with Legal Mindset tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. Pacific. Uh, and then uh, I'll be talking with Christian Toto on Friday, and I don't know when that one's going to run. Well, that's too early for me. Yeah. But I'll watch the replay. Well, I thought you bailed on uh, on Midnight's Edge. That's why I came in for you because I you were bail. I was just late. Uh, I told them I'd be late. Okay. Well, I think they thought you were gonna be really late. I think that's why they sent me the link. 
That's all good, man. Uh, all which, good. Uh, if you watch my appearance on Midnight's Edge, I managed to piss off the chat uh, on two occasions. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. All right. We're going to... Um, sorry, I got a, a reset here. We're going to do a reset. Well, what do we do when we do a reset sometimes is we... Um, we fumble around, me guessing what you're going to Well, do if that. you t- put the other banner there, it would always help yeah. me if you take the banner off. Yeah. Well, when I say reset or pivot... Take the banner off to the next thing. Okay. So, okay. Uh, all right. That one? No, take it off. I want to show a video for a uh, second. Okay. All right. Have you seen this? Imagine, if you will, a stormtrooper who pushes both real and imagined story boundaries. One who turns coat on his fellow troopers. Could he be a new, new hope? A way shower for other lost, brainwashed, and traffic troopers? Nope. We were just joking and made him into a clown. You've entered the JJ zone. That's from a website called gaslightstation.com. Oh, you'll like this one. Imagine, if you will, Luke Skywalker. Young, innocent, handy with a moisture evaporator, strong with a force. He became the new hope, incarnate. He would go on to become the stuff that legends aren't made of. Thanks to one Rianne Johnson. Yeah, I said Rianne. Luke all but woke up in a back alley with his pants undone. No logic. No reason. One explanation. You've entered the Kennedy Zone. That's from uh, GaslightStation.com. Yeah. You know what I forgot? It's weird when AI thing. stops looking pretty. Prepare her for our pleasure. And you know what's so funny? We did that whole segment. You know what I forgot to play? This is a note to Glenn. Could you clip that and put it at the well, beginning? He has the video. Just put the it end in front of, of the video. Yeah. Because I forgot to I forgot to play it. I like to see Asians in movies. You know, people, I mean, I have to constantly be saying that. I hate gay films. No, I hate films with women in it. You're not straight. Hmm. I think that's a perfect way to end that uh, story there. (laughs) Yeah, all right. All right. The Sundance Film Festival is upon us. Film Threat will be aggressively covering both the Sundance Film Festival and the Slamdance Film Festival. Um, We're just going to do a short preview, and then I want to show an article. But there's a couple things uh, I have to say. One what films are playing at Sundance? Are there, are there any good ones that stand out to you, Alan? Ah, uh, let me see. The the ones, not really. Before, before <laughs> we do that, let's actually talk about, like, I want to, um, you know, you have seen, you watching this, have seen movies that have played Sundance. Sundance mm-hmm. is was considered what they call a discovery festival. It's where you discover new talent, new filmmakers, um, films that could go on to win awards at the Oscars. So it's a, it's um, pre in previous years has been a very prestigious film festival. And I do have evidence to that effect. I am going to share here a story. This is actually from uh, the Sundance website. And they asked people who visit the website. Well, after four decades of the Sundance film festival, what are the 10 great movies that have come come from the festival? They just asked people to send in suggestions Mm -hmm. and compile this list. So this is from people who are, I'm guessing Sundance fans. We're going to look at it and you've seen most of these movies. Uh, I've been going to the Sundance film festival since the mid nineties. I have not gone in recent years, but uh, here we go. Blood simple by Joel and Ethan Cohen from uh, 1985. That played at Sundance. It was then called the United States Film Festival. But uh, Blood Simple, everybody knows that movie. Uh, e Tu Mama Tambien from 2002, director Alfonso Cuaron. That's uh, number nine on this list. Moving on, Boyhood from 2014 from director Richard Linklater. Boyhood premiered at Sundance, also went on to win the Oscar that year. I'm a big Linklater fan. Additionally, before Sunrise, 1995, Richard Linklater. That also premiered at Sundance. How about this? 
Sex Lies and Videotape from 1989. That was uh, director Steven Soderbergh, the movie that really broke him out as a director. And uh, this shouldn't surprise you, Memento from 2001. I was there that year that Memento came out. It was the talk of the of the festival. And there's uh, Guy Pierce pictured with uh, Christopher Nolan. That's number five on this list. Memento also won the Waldo Salt Screenwriting Award for Christopher Nolan. Uh, moving on, Little Miss Sunshine, which did Little Miss Sunshine win Best Picture? No. It was no. nominated. It was nominated. It was nominated. It definitely didn't win. Okay. Uh, from 2006, that's number four on this list. So there you are. And here we go. Jordan Peele with Get Out. That played Sundance back in the day. So that was uh, Jordan Peele really uh, broke out based on that film. Uh, Reservoir Dogs from 1992. Quentin Tarantino. And Quentin Tarantino developed Reservoir Dogs at the... Um, Sundance Institute. The Sundance Sundance is not just a festival; it's an institute that supports up and coming filmmakers. So there you are. And number one on the list, Damien Chazelle from 2014, Whiplash, won the Audience Award and the uh, U.S. Dramatic and Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. So these are ten movies you've probably heard of that have played Sundance. Now, let me just say this. There's not a movie on this list from the last decade. 2014 being the latest. So I don't know what your thoughts are. Uh, are there any that uh, others that you would add? I would, I, I mean, there's a lot of great films that have played Sundance. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I this is going to be a, a telling year for Sundance. How uh, so? Well, part of it is me going down the list and uh, trying to find movies to watch. Uh, you know, <laughs> every every year, you know, every year it used to be uh, this cool exercise of, you know, four of us would go. You have a limited number of tickets. We didn't want to have cross cross pollination. So everyone had to choose movies. It was kind of like uh, draft picks. Mm -hmm. And um, and th that used to be an exciting process. Uh, because of the films that we're playing uh, this year, it was like, uh, you know, I, you know. First of all, we're 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 attending virtually. We have one person on the ground there. Uh, I had a limited number of tickets of the online the the films available only online, and I'm looking at the list. I'm going. I'm just not super excited about anything here compared to like last year. Mm. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know last year the the big surprise to me was Pod Generation. Um, but at least mm -hmm. a couple of other films that that really piqued my interest. Uh, the year before that, uh, Prisoners of the Ghostland was was on the list. Um, and this year, it's just like it's very, uh, you know, it, it just feels, you know, it, it continues to lean toward the issues oriented type films. Um, and then if if there is a movie that has a celebrity in it, it's already been bought, it's already been sold. This they're just using Sundance to, to as, as promotion. And and I think that was the 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 year the one single year that I went actually went to Park City. Um, that was the impression I got was that uh, everyone was there for all the studio films, you know, films that are going to theaters or appearing on streamers, and uh, less recognition on the true indies that were attending that year. Well, this uh, is the disappointment. This is the disappointment of Sundance over the last few years, which is why I think it's become a mm -hmm. less significant festival. And that is because many of the films that you're seeing, it's like, and no disrespect to wrestling. Okay. <laughs> wrestling, the outcome of a wrestling match is determined before the match takes place. Now there's a lot of finesse. There's a lot of finesse and uh, physicality getting to that conclusion but Sundance is like a wrestling match. You know the conclusion. A lot of these movies are picked up for distribution before Sundance even happens. And then they make the announcement that, hey, we picked up this movie for distribution. They make the announcement at Sundance because it gets a lot of press. So it looks like people go to Sundance to buy movies. They negotiated that months ago. They're just using Sundance as a platform to announce that they picked up the film for distribution. Mm-hmm. The other thing is I don't remember Sundance being more political at any time than now. If your politics in your film don't check a certain box or several yeah. boxes, you will not get into Sundance. 
And almost all documentaries that I see now are all agenda driven. They all have financiers trying to push an agenda. There was a movie about AOC that played Sundance a couple of years ago that was yeah. like, oh my God, this is just a love letter to AOC who has accomplished nothing yeah. as a congressperson. Well, last year there was a Beto O'Rourke uh, documentary. Right. A Beto O'Rourke, who he's, he's a, the guy's a loser. He's a loser. And he's run, I, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not a, I'm not yeah. a, I'm not a I, I fan mean, of like making someone a hero, making some after they haven't accomplished anything yet. Let's, you know what, in 20 years, come back and let's see what AOC has accomplished. If yeah. anything, I mean, um, like but, I, I'm looking at the, the basically your traditional white films and uh, you know, there's a documentary about Tammy Faye Baker. Uh, there's a Devo documentary. Of course they're going to have the Devo documentary because people will see it. But my guess is, is that move. Yeah. Well, the thing is this, I don't mind having big star-driven movies that premiere at the festival. That's great. Here's the problem. Journalists are lazy and they're not going to cover shorts. They're not going to cover the small indie movies. They're not going to cover, does anyone even know other than me? Does anyone even know that Sundance has a program called Frontier, uh, the Frontier program where they, where they, they feature certain types of filmmakers right? Like they have like this, um, a program that, and they've had it for years that gets virtually no attention whatsoever. So, yeah. well, um, uh, you mentioned journalists being lazy. I will tell you this. We, our person on the ground there this year was there last year. Uh, the press was there. Uh, it's a 10 day festival starting Thursday, ending the following Sunday. The press was there the opening weekend. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and they were gone after that. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, that's how important uh, the journalism feels about uh, Sundance is. You know, they well, can't. You know, there's there's nothing of note that happens after the weekend's over. Well, I'll say this: Sundance has changed a lot, and I think that it's become very political. You have to, you know, you have to espouse certain views if you even have, want want a chance of your film to 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 be accepted or even considered. And I miss the. Uh, the truly diverse documentaries and whatnot. Um, and I miss them rolling the dice on a filmmaker. No one's heard of just because it's a good film, not because they're checking a box uh, with regard to identity. I think they've overplayed that hand. So I mean, um, the one, the one film on the uh, top 10 list that stuck out to me was get out. I mean, was that, wasn't that already bought and picked up or uh, was it looking? Yeah. For, yeah. It fit that category, but I really like that film and I like Jordan Peele as a filmmaker. Um, so I think that that makes sense to me, but I, 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 I miss the days. A Sundance film. That's, you know, right. Right. But I miss, I miss the days of, I mean, the movie was distributed by universal, but I miss the days of when they would just take an unknown filmmaker from like the Midwest who just made a quality movie. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a movie. Hundreds of beavers. Why isn't hundreds of beavers at Sundance directed by Mike Cheslick? starring Ryland twos um, go look up the hundreds of beavers, uh, the hundreds of beavers trailer on the film threat YouTube channel, or maybe it's on our trailers channel, but look mm. up hundreds of beavers, just a fun movie. It's a fun little movie made by like three people. Brilliant. It's like a live action Looney tunes. When it's released, we're going to get the filmmakers on the show, mm -hmm. but that's a movie that Sundance should be championing. I want to see small indie movies that, are trying to find a market. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna cover Sundance more next week once Alan and I have had an opportunity to see some of the films at both Sundance and Slam Dance. Yeah. So there you go. Any but, final thoughts? We've got we've yeah. got our interview guest joining us momentarily. Yeah. My, my final thought. thought is uh, my final thought is Slam Dance is happening. Um, you can attend Slam Dance online uh, for I believe it's under twenty dollars. So you can see all the films uh, being presented at Slam Dance. Uh, also, uh, we're getting a lot of interview requests for Slam Dance. So, um, so yeah, I have an interview with J Chris Jericho for his film, uh, The Death Tour. Um, and then I also mentioned, I just did an uh, interview with Lucy Lawless. She has a film at Sundance. Oh, uh, that's on the interviews channel. That's on the interviews channel. The, the yeah, Lucy so check Lawless that out. interview is there now. Great. Well, keep up for all your Sundance news. Keep up with Film Threat, and uh, we're going to be covering more aggressively. We just wanted to give you a preview 
And um, there, I do believe that there, there are always gems. There are always gems that you can uncover. They're diamonds in the rough. Yeah. And uh, we'll be looking for those. I'm probably going to mostly check out slam dance movies this weekend. Mm -hmm. I'm just, cause I just, I like slam dance. Yeah. I like slam dance. Yeah. And like I, I said, said, I think, I think it's under $20 for you to see all the slam dance films. Oh, that's fantastic. All right. It's time to pivot. And this is going to seem really weird to play this right now. Prepare her for our pleasure. Why would you play that? Why would you play that? Well, that's because we have Dr. Rebecca Louisa Smith joining us. That's a quote from Ming the Merciless. Flash Gordon. <laughs> oh, my God. Good to see you, Rebecca. Good to see you, too. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on the show. The timing could not be better. Um, uh, tell us about your work as the film festival doctor. Yeah. So I'm a film festival uh, consultant and I help my filmmaker clients get their films into film festivals around the world. So people come to me and say, right, I've made a film. What do I do with it? Which festivals do I send it to? How do I get it seen on the circuit? And I create the right kind of strategy to get it into the right kinds of festivals. And what would you say, like, um, this is something I've, I, I wrote a book on film festivals. I've helped, but boy, the industry has changed a lot recently. Yeah. And if you've got a certain type of film, you're kind of trying to match this type of movie to a specific, uh, to a specific festival where it might fit. Yeah. There are, for example, if you've made a small horror film, there are a lot of horror film festivals. Yeah. What's the, what's the process like when they come to you? So the first thing we have to do is to look at the film. That is obviously the key thing and to look at it and, and think, right, have they made a film that festivals are going to want? And if so, what different types of festivals, what level interior festivals? So the festival, sorry, the filmmaker might say, I want to submit to Sundance, Slamdance and South by Southwest and all this kind of stuff. You have to think, well, first of all, have we got a film that those kinds of festivals are going to want? If we have, we can then start to plan. If we haven't, we think of a plan B. It's going to be festivals are going to want it. We just have to be very strategic, very focused and very streamlined. Cool. So can you tell us how you think the industry has changed in recent years? Before you uh, joined us on the show with my colleague, I guess I should introduce myself. Yeah. I'm, do that. <laughs> I'm Chris Gore. This is Alan Ng, Hi. Uh, my uh, co-host on the show. We're each other's co-hosts, I guess. But it's um, we were talking about how much Sundance has changed. I don't know. And also, I don't even know if the dream is to get into Sundance or one of the big festivals. I don't believe you need to do that anymore. Yeah. I don't believe that the big festivals are 100% necessary uh, to have a successful film. And by successful film, all I, I, I think the barometer for success is get distribution, get paid so people can see your movie. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's a very good point you say that because it's not a case of, you know, just to get distribution and, you know, notable awards and exposure it can only be done at Sundance and Cannes and Berlin and Tribeca and all those kind of ones. Obviously, they do help a lot and they're brilliant, but other festivals offer good opportunities as well that can result in those goals being achieved, distribution, sales, um, getting the right connections. So it can. Like, it's it's can be quite a very narrow view. So filmmakers think that's the only way to get those goals to be achieved. It has to be in the top tier. But for example, uh, we've had film screen at the St. Louis Film Festival, which is a great Oscar qualifying festival. And they got distribution through that. Dances with Films helped a lot as well, smaller ones than that. And also we did really well at Indie Shorts um, for short film distribution. So there's loads of possibilities and abundance at festivals. And that's any festival that's worth its salt can certainly help filmmakers go far. Great. Uh, what are the things, one of the things uh, for those watching, we've got about almost 1,500 people watching us live on YouTube. Please smash that like button subscribe to the channel if you're not a subscriber. Uh, but we also have a lot of aspiring filmmakers who watch our show. So we'll do interviews with filmmakers and bring on experts and people like yourself. I think it's important to understand for those not familiar with a film festival, why are you going to a festival? What are the, what are the benefits for a filmmaker uh, to take their movie to a film festival? Yeah. So the key benefits are is that festivals have an abundance of networking opportunities with all different kinds of other filmmakers, other industry professionals, 
all that kind of stuff. So it's where networking is where a lot of the good things can happen by building up relationships. Um, it might not be a case of that when you're there during the festival, you get a sales deal or distribution deal, whatever. It's more a case of building up a good relationship to like and trust that person after the festival, meet up, all that kind of thing. So festivals are like the kind of key place to plant that seed and be a good stepping stone towards achieving the bigger picture goal without a doubt obviously they do offer as well you know prizes it was fun you know and awards that can certainly maybe sometimes even help you get qualified to submit to the oscars um and bafta and biff have qualified festivals as well in the uk um there's a lot that they can do just by meeting people in the with the right energy the right frame of mind there's a lot you can get from that yeah there are certain festivals um uh, you can look up a list of them that if you win an award for your short film at this festival, you are then qualified. It doesn't mean you'll get nominated, but you're um, eligible to be nominated for an Oscar if you win an award as a short film at a particular festival. There's a list. I believe actually the Oscars actually has the list. Oscars. Yeah. Me. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So they actually also offer it now to documentary features, not narrative oh, wow. features. Yeah. Um, animation short, um, student Oscars is a separate thing. But yes, yeah, so if your film wins the Oscar qualifying award and the festival, which is Oscar qualifying, <laughs> then you have then the eligibility to submit without having to do a release theatrically. We have to spend a lot of money on, you know, hiring a theater. It's great when you win that award because it does help you save some money. One of the things um, when I got the email, I think uh, from your publicist talking about having you on as a guest was talked about um, just mental health while you're at a festival, which I, th I actually think is, I, I think you could apply that not just to film festivals, but um, working in entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. I'm being serious. Yeah. So, so, so for a second um, to, to go down this road, I, I'm going to hand it off to you, but, I think it's always important if you're taking a film to a festival, lower your expectation. Yeah. Whatever yeah. you think is going to happen, you know, don't, don't think you're going to win awards. Yeah. Don't think someone's going to give you a million dollar check. You know what? You, you might get some free drinks and appetizers that you could <laughs> probably, that's an expectation that you're, I think is fair to have, but, um, but anything else you can really spiral into a depression if you have, some expectations about I'm going to go to the festival and this is going to happen or whatever. It's like, no, 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 no. So I always think it's important. Keywords manage expectations. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, you're spot on. You know, the, the more you can detach, the better. So, you know, not expecting to win. Think, oh, yeah, come in there with, you know, really, really confident, like my film can smash it all. And it could be that it gets really good marks, but it might just not quite get the award because it just gets put to the post. So you can't expect things to happen. It needs to be important to, like, leave aside any kind of ego and like, leave aside, you know, expectation is a really good thing. Also, what I'd say to that is in the very beginning of the process is when you finish the film, and you're now going to be going into the world of film festivals and doing submissions and attending festivals, all that fun stuff. It's important to detach emotionally from your film because it's now a product. So when you were making it, it was all that arduous emotional journey of getting it from script to screen into the edit suite and finished. That is obviously a lot of work and that's very creative, very obviously a lot of emotions involved in that. But it's really important that you detach emotionally from your film. It might still be your baby and the work of art and pride and joy, which is true. But it's important that in the world of film festivals, they don't care about that. So they don't care if it took 10 years to make and it was made for made in a day or made for a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars or whatever it might be. That's not what they're looking for. You're looking at the actual film and they judge it based on the film. And that's that. So if you don't agree with their opinion, then it's important that you detach emotionally so you don't respond emotionally um, and have an upsetting journey and take rejection personally because that's not a good thing. Well, I'll say this, having had several films on the festival circuit, that's really, really good advice. So uh, we've got a lot of people watching live. We've got a bunch of questions from our chat. Do you mind if we go to some of these questions? Absolutely. Fire away. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to start here with Christopher Moonlight Productions asks, it sounds like it's not worth submitting to a film fest if you can't attend. How much should an indie filmmaker set aside in their budget for them? 
That's a good question. I'd say it's important in terms of money is to think about, first of all, what your goals are. So if, you're, if your key goal is to meet new filmmakers and network and connect, and let's say you live here in the US, then maybe stick to um, traveling domestically just in the US, because obviously it's going to cost a lot of money to go to Australia or Fiji and even the UK. So it's going to be more in, you know, in travel and accommodation. So I'd say maybe think about where you want to network and what kinds of festivals you want to attend. So let's say it's domestically in the US, then I'd say set aside, you know, don't go to every single festival. It goes about the goals again. So if you're really keen to connect with, you know, higher player industry figures and you've got into the Palm Springs Film Festival and definitely attend, get the flight there, look at Good, good accommodation, use your all kind of like vouchers and air miles. And then maybe say that would be a round trip, which probably be maybe between 500 and 850, depending on how much you want to spend on eating and drinking and where. Because obviously we have to take into that account is not just the cost of a flight and the cost of accommodation, like an Airbnb or couch surfing, but also the cost of living there. So do you have to use Uber? Can you walk? Can you get a scooter? Do you have to hire a car? Um, do you also think you have to also think about the food and drink prices? Is it is it expensive in Palm Springs? Yes. Is it going to be expensive in, say, Oklahoma? Not as much. So it's kind of a case of doing research, looking at the average cost for a meal and drinking and living there for maybe a couple of days. That will give you a really, you know, really, really good ballpark. I, I will say having I had a movie years ago on the festival circuit and um, we set aside between 30 and 40 thousand dollars. You yep. ended up not having to spend it. We went to 40 different film festivals, ended up not spending we spent probably less than half of that money because some festivals will, um, you know, will actually cover some travel costs, yeah. flight and hotel. Once you've got flight and hotel covered, I feel like it's important to learn to graze. Yes. So when you, when you go to like festival events, they generally have go for the protein. So if they yeah. have chicken <laughs> strips, eat those, eat healthy, if you can. And, and basically I think it's important when you're at festivals to, to uh, this is going to sound weird advice, take vitamins and <laughs> eat at least one good meal a day. Yes. And drink a lot of water. That is that is spot on. In fact, you can maybe even if you go to lots of like little um, networking events that have canapes, you can fill up on canapes, you know, have a couple of those and you're like, oh, I had a meal now. Uh, but yes, that's true about some festivals can cover travel accommodation, not always for short filmmakers, but with features that definitely is a case. Um, it just, every festival is different. It's important to remember when you start your journey, when you're going to be traveling to them and working with festivals to get your uh, film um, exhibition copies sent all the materials etc that every festival is different in terms of how they communicate with you what information they give you what money they can give you towards you know sundry expenses all that kind of stuff so it's important to be able to navigate around them and um, just be able to you know be flexible <laughs> cool I would um, also say even the big uh, festivals they're not organized uh, on day one yeah <laughs> just be prepared to uh, That's just investigate for yourself yeah, yeah they're, I mean, they're, they're seasonal events, so you do have to kind of cut some slack. My advice is always just be nice to the volunteers. Yeah. If someone who's a volunteer at a festival this year is running the festival in yeah. five years or less. Exactly. Um, a comment here from Jen Exer on the farm. We went to Sundance in 2002 and 2003, enjoyed slam dance, no dance, and trauma dance. Got to meet a ton of great people at these smaller festivals. Chris Gore sighting at all three. Oh, Thank yeah. you, Jen Exer. <laughs> Wow. On the farm. Say hi next time. Say yeah. hi next time. Well, that's 20 um, years ago, but yeah. <laughs> Brock Samsonite says, is there a known list of disqualifications for submissions? Well, that's a good question. So in terms of a list, in terms of what you'll get disqualified, it's not a case of, you know, if you don't upload to your film freeway project page, a poster, you'll get disqualified. They might just send you an email going, please upload it at your earliest convenience. But in terms of disqualification, it would be maybe one of the things you can get disqualified for is submitting to the wrong category or having a film that will not fit the festival because it's obviously not going to be what they're looking for. So, for example, sending to, say, a film festival celebrating deaf uh, films, check the T's and C's. Do you have to be a deaf filmmaker or not? If it's going to be all deaf filmmakers only and you're not deaf, they could disqualify for that reason. Also, incomplete submission can be sometimes having a rough cut of a film, which needs to be the finished cut, or having a film that is so incomplete they can't review it, that can get you disqualified. Um, and also sometimes 
another big thing for disqualification, which isn't maybe written, you know, in stone or on a website somewhere, is not being able to offer the film festival the premiere that they want. So, for example, say that you submit to a festival and they can see that you, on your screening timeline, and your screenings and awards section, that you've already had a screening in the UK and they have a UK premiere, then it's going to be disqualification because you can't offer them what they want. Right. Uh, more questions here. Uh, Christopher Moonlight Productions, what are the reasons that an indie filmmaker wants to be in a festival outside of distribution? Do accolades bring the audience? So, yes. So in terms of, um, first of all, what you have to really have to do before you start doing in submissions is think about who is the audience for my film. And then say it's a say it's a genre film and it's a good horror film, then obviously horror festivals will be a very key target. Um, so being there, you'll be in the right uh, like appreciation group and get good feedback on the film, get good responses, know where the film stands. So the festival have an audience for your film. So there's two things are matched together. Um, also, the reason can be obviously getting, you know, good reception and having, you know, um, a good response and accolades and awards and nominations, all that kind of fun stuff. But also it's important for your social media to show that you were at this festival in official selection and you were there doing your Q&A. So getting lots of content for your socials and your website is really important that festivals can offer you with that platform. So always have a picture behind what we call the step and repeat. I'm sure you know what that is. But you know, when you mm -hmm. go to Slam Dance, it has in the background, Slam Dance, all the sponsors. That's important because it shows you were there with your film, get pictures of people taking pictures of you doing the Q&A, videos, all that good stuff will help a lot. Um, wow. So we'll show them what you're doing. Some people don't like doing it, but it's really important nowadays. Never used to be, as Chris has probably mentioned in previous um, previous shows, but like now it is. <laughs> Do you think uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's too many festivals? I mean, I see films sometimes with maybe 20 laurels in its poster. Is, is there too much or... Well, I first of all, I think there are way too many scam film festivals, um, and I don't like the Film Freeway doesn't really vet them. Um, so, for example, we ha there's this thing that keeps going around in my in, in my inbox called Dallas uh, Movie Awards, and I know all the because I live in Dallas, and I know all the people in the industry here, you know, the, fe the festival, you know, the festival um, uh, programmers and the key kind of directors. And then I thought, I don't know this person's name. So I asked everybody around. They were like, don't recognize this. So we thought, well, let's give them a call and say we want to sponsor the festival you know, because it's local. So we called them. And obviously, this is the Dallas Movie Awards. There's no sign that it's live. It did say online. And all these awards, you know, you can win like 50 of them. It's ridiculous. So we you know, emailed them. We got this uh, email back. Said, oh, yes, call this number. And it was an Indian call center. So we were like, no, this is not good. <laughs> Wow. This is wow. not good. I was like, this needs to be taken down. But obviously, oh, wow. That's, that's bad. bad. That's yeah. Bad. So all of that. So sometimes I do, you know, see posters which have got all these like, you know, the Indie Short Film Awards and the Indie Fest Awards. And these all things are online. So they're not real festivals. So I don't see it as a genuine accolade because it's not a film festival. Um mm. So there are a lot of those, and I think there are a lot of festivals now more well, than what they used to be when I first started doing this. Um, but of course, a lot of the key ones are the ones which are Oscar and BAFTA qualified, which is a small amount everyone submits to, because they're the ones that people, you know, might need to submit to to get far to go on the Oscar and BAFTA route. Um, but there are some also really good ones below that. But there are quite a lot more that are trying to get to that level, which aren't quite there yet, and will take a long time until they do, if they can sustain the pace. Because I think sometimes. A lot of festivals start up and they realize it's harder than what they think to run it. Well, I think one of the best award shows that not a lot of people know about is Award This. Man. Mm. If you go to awardthis.com, it's uh, we put that on. That's Film Threat does that every year. So we take the best movies that we've reviewed over the uh, previous year. They have to be reviewed on Film Threat. That's the only that that and you have to have distribution. Only two qualifications. And we do a live award show. We put it on YouTube. Uh, the filmmakers get drinks and, and you know, if bag. whatever. <laughs> <With that. laughs> well, if bag. The end, and then they get a physical award. So we actually, we do that. I mean, basically, it's just a way for us to draw attention to, you know, uh, to their work. And yeah. I, do, I do think it's important. Like when you go, you're actually getting content, which helps you promote and market your movie, whether it's reviews, um, red carpets, or we even like for a movie that I did years ago, we filmed the Q&A at the festival and then put that on the Blu-ray 
we put that on the DVD for the movie. Nice. So, that's, so it's like we got some some of that kind of stuff. Um, right. Immortal Remus's question for Doctor Smith. It sounds very very. <laughs> I, I assume you are from England like me. I apologize if I'm wrong, but I ask, what is it like in this day and age for an indie English filmmaker to try and make it with their film? So, yes, I am from the UK originally. I reside now in the US. <clears throat> and in terms of what it's like for an indie English filmmaker to try and make it with the film, well, obviously, I presume that you are still based in the in the UK and there is a very good community of filmmakers in the UK, especially in Soho, London, and a good networks and good community. So I suggest is to keep going to events which are run by filmmakers who are looking to connect with more filmmakers to build a good support network and can then help, you know, maybe connect with more people to get you know, off the ground you can trust to produce and all that kind of stuff and help you. So the, I think the key thing to answer your question there is to build community and to build good relationships that you, people who you can trust. And I'll look at that good stuff in the UK. If you go on like Monday.com, shooting people, they're really good. And also there's a lot of really good festivals in the UK, which are BIFA qualify, which is the British Independent Film Awards. Those are really good. Like the Spirit of Independence Film Festival is for filmmakers, you know, indie filmmakers that make on low budgets. That's a really good festival. Norwich Film Festival is brilliant. And in London, you've got tons of others, you know, Edinburgh Film Festival, obviously Edinburgh Short Film Festival, there's loads. So you can definitely meet and connect with people there to find that good network, a good support network. And Flav, who's a member, just gifted 10 Film Threat memberships. Thank you so much for that. Check out our members tab on, fil on the Film Threat YouTube channel. Patrick Lemire asks, have you ever told a filmmaker to clean up their presentation? If that means, does that mean um, how they look in their, uh, in their dress? Or does it mean their film freeway page? <laughs> I'll say this. I'll say this, just having had a bunch of films on the festival circuit. I think it is important to have the best ambassador for your movie put yeah. forward that may not always be the director it might be a producer it might be one of the actors who is who is has a good public facing can represent the movie uh whether it's the media or whatever and then i always say this it's in my book the ultimate film festival survival guide have a unique look like yeah. like if you wear an orange hat wear it at every festival you're, yeah. You've got the orange hat, whatever it is, or you've got a certain look. You always dress in, in tuxedo tails. Yeah. I, okay, that's these are ridiculous, but you know <laughs> what I mean. It's like, like there's certain filmmakers that you know because of the way they look, right? Yeah, like, it's Tim distinctive. Burton, yeah, yeah distinctive. Tim Burton, very distinctive. So I don't know if it's like clean up. I think it's a very uh, festivals. There's a lot of different types of people, but yeah. I think it's, it's important. Like, who is really good at dealing with media? And exactly. then beyond message. Yeah, exactly. In terms of that, to answer that question, that respect is, yeah. So, I mean, I always, I always tell my filmmakers, you know, they can wear what they want, you know, if they want to wear, you know, top hat and tails or a suit and tie or Why like not? a leather jacket. They can wear what they want. The key thing to think about is them to have a very positive attitude. That's the key thing. And to be open to collaboration, open to new things occurring that you might not have thought about or, you know, assumed and be open that way you're, you won't miss things. So it's more a case of don't go in there expecting things like you said earlier, Chris, and instead go in with like low expectations, but also just a really clear neutral mindset and get excited that you're there and what might happen because there's so much stuff that could. And uh, it's okay to laugh asks a question. <laughs> Which are some of the best festivals for TV, web series, pilots, uh, POC? Okay. So definitely for episodics, I've actually just started to work with a filmmaker who has an episodic right now, which is a pilot, which is very funny. Um, definitely without a doubt, Series Fest is like the holy grail for episodics and uh, web series. Then Catalyst Content, uh, definitely that one is exceptional. Also, a lot of festivals which are local to you, let's say if you're in LA, some of those general festivals do have um, – uh, categories for episodics or web series like Holly Shorts, for example, has both television and web series. And LA Shorts has episodics as well, which are both Oscar qualifying festivals and good for that kind of content, the accessible content. Um, in terms of POC, um, I would also suggest that, I mean, that there are some festivals that do have a category for that. There's not a huge amount, but some of them do. But the best one for proof of concept is, believe it or not, 
the Proof Film Festival. <laughs> it's wow. just started up, but it had its first year at the um, American Cinematheque. One of my clients won the best festival. And they give you a prize, which is equipment to make the film to so a camera. So obviously it gives you, you know, kind of gives you a lot of good stuff to get it started. Um, and it's all just proof of concepts, obviously well-made high-end proof of concepts, but they do ask that when you submit that you do send um, a statement of intent explaining how the short will become a feature. So what are the key themes, the world you set up, the character traits, all that kind of stuff is really important to show that you do have the vision and it's intact to then win a prize that could help you get it made, you know, so it's serious about that form. So those are my top, top ones for you for that. Yeah, just to be clear, POC, proof of concept. Yeah, um, concept. We went to, I just Googled Series Fest and it came right up. Yep. That's a Series very Fest. good, right. really good suggestion. That's awesome. One last question here and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Check Your Brain Productions says, what if your film doesn't have a quote message? It's just a good old fashioned escape for the audience. Is the film festival path the right one to take? So the short answer is yes. Not every festival film has to be a message movie. Um, if it's a good old fashioned, as you say, like, you know, fun and games, um, that's fine. There's going to be an audience for it somewhere. It might not be, say, the art house film festivals like Locarno and Colabia Vary, obviously, because those films are more of a different kind of audience. But that, that does exist. For example, there's a film I worked on, which was a very fun film, a really good comedy, you know, lots of laughs, a bit predictable, but it was so much fun, good dialogue performances and a really good length and it did well at local festivals what we call the local regional festivals that had that general kind of mainstream audience that were not looking for deep message hardcore you know art house movies looking for fun so yes is the short answer just just requires more research and more patience to look at those ones that do screen that kind of content but the short answer is yes and don't give up because you can have a lot of fun on the circuit with a film that's a lot of fun i i would i would add that um maybe you're lucky you don't that the festival circuit can be an option, but isn't necessary. I, I've had films on the festival circuit. The latest movie that I made, I just, I didn't take it to festivals. I think it's just too commercial for festivals. And I just thought, well, you know what? It, timing was important with it. And I released my, my film attack of the doc. Just, uh, you're a distributor. Great. There you go. Well, sounds, like someone's in, sounds like someone's in the kitchen. <laughs> this is my, my water just fell. <laughs> oh no. Well, Luckily, uh, it's uh, it's not it's not leaked. Well, uh, Rebecca, I want to thank you for being on uh, the Film Threat Livecast right now. You are the Film Festival Doctor. How can people reach you? Um, you can reach me on my website, which is thefilmfestivaldoctor.com, and also good old Instagram, which is at Rebecca Film Doctor. R e b e k h f i l m d r. That's great. Uh, thank you again for being here. We appreciate it. And uh, just to everyone watching, we bring people on to give you advice if you're an aspiring filmmaker and hope we're going to continue to bring on more people. I also want to say our Sundance and Slamdance coverage will continue into next week. Rebecca, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It was so much fun. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Uh, that was great. Yeah. She was great. There you go. All right. And by the uh, way, POC we'll means uh, proof of concept. And, uh, I said that. I know people are still <laughs> confused. Right. It's pro POC proof of concept. I think I, I, think know, I hate acronyms. That's... Just spell it out. Just spell it out. It's yeah. all good. It's all or good. Just say it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to say, uh, wait, I got something here. I just want to say thank you to everyone. I want to pull out my Alan. I don't know if you got one of these in the I gift didn't. bag. Did you get a did you get no, a, I did was there a gift bag? Board? Did you did you get the hat? I did, did not get your, the did hat. you keep your ticket? Oh, you didn't get the hat. Oh, That's okay. No. I got you an extra hat. Oh gosh. I thanks. think you had so I, I grabbed you a hat. Yeah. So That's okay. remind I got the hoodie last year and you did. So uh, I'll trade you for a hoodie. No. <laughs> I'll uh next time I see you, remind me, I'll bring you one of the hats. Okay. I'll bring you one of the hats. Uh that's gonna leave that's gonna wrap it up for us today. I just want to say thank you to our mods, whoever the mods were for today. Uh Lord Thoth. Latino slant. I want to thank Ms. P coffee. I want to thank Glenn Brown, our producer who put in all those weird clips, including <laughs> my new, the, my new favorite clip. Prepare her for our pleasure. 
It was every time we bring on a female guest, you're going to play that. (laughs) It was very odd timing for Alan to play that before she joined the show. But, uh, but there you are. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Thank you to our mods. Uh, Lord Lord thought today. Thank you. I understand there was the chat was getting a little spicy today. (laughs) Spicy chat. Had to ban someone. We had, um, 15, 1600 people watching us live. That's great. So I just want to say how much we appreciate, um, everyone who helps us put the show together and uh, we appreciate you, the audience Friday. We are back. We have reviews. Oh, you are not going to believe we're talking ISS international space station. We have the review founders day, new horror film coming out origin. A lot of fun stuff happening on Friday, including other films that Alan's going to review, right? Alan. Yes. I'm trying to see a double down South. And then I may have a uh, Sundance or Slam Dance review as well. We might even have like a. Can we get to end on this? I don't know. Glenn said we should show this. I don't know if we should show this. Am I going to end the show on this? I might end the show. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. You know the answer is always yes. A- I, I'm going to. He said I should show this on the show, and he, you and I should react to it. Okay. So for those of you who stuck around, the thousand people still watching, you're going to get a little treat. Here we go. Glad I should show this. Are you ready to see the Twilight Zone Kennedy Zone? I don't know what this is. Just when the fan of thought they could restore sanity to the galaxy, they're witnessing an assault more egregious than the destruction of the Hossian system or the making of the Disney Star Wars sequel trilogy. After the mouse wrecked Star Wars and other beloved franchises, lost billions and was shunned by its audiences. Surely it would be time to return to what once made it, and the stories it paid up seeing cash for great again. Surely, capitalism, if not creativity, must kick in at some point. Not so fast, by the one. You've entered the Kennedy Zone, introducing one Charmin Obeyed Shinoy, a woman of color, of substance, activist, accidental filmmaker, righteous and outspoken. She likes to make statements starting with her hats. In a move not dissimilar to putting Chloe Zhao at the head of a mega-million Marvel movie, or taking the manager of his simple bodega and installing them as the chief operating officer at Amazon, Disney, insisting this is an important move and not one of fuck you all, has doubled down on crapping in a bucket and placed self-proclaimed fixer of all things male, Charmin girl Obey Me Shinoy on the intersectional movie-making throne, crowning her as the new empress of the all-but-dead galactic empire. For my money, the show has already begun. Hand me the popcorn. Not skipping a beat, Charlemagne stated, it's about time a woman shaped Star Wars. Immediately shaming men for making Star Wars what it was and dissing all of the many integral women who made Star Wars great, including the original Star Wars editor, Marshall Lucas, who earned an Academy Award for editing and thereby literally shaping Star Wars on a flatbed film editing rig no less. Oh boy, Shinoy was installed by the much uncelebrated Kathleen Palpatine Kennedy, who herself has admitted she has already taken all of the fun out of Star Wars. So we're starting below the ground floor on something completely different than anything ever imagined by the incredibly imaginative creator of Star Wars, George Lucas. Charmaine has already made the news and talk circuits, so I never went to gleefully and proudly announcing she didn't study film. The mainstream media has perplexed that that's engendered the same faith in and celebration of an airline pilot announcing she's never taken flight training on even a Cessna, not to mention the launching and landing of Boeing 747. Looks like Kathleen and Bob are still getting in their laughs and throwing acid in the eyes of the Star Wars fandom. The dark side of the Force is truly one. You fools. That's because you can never leave. You are all trapped for eternity in the Kennedy Zone. <laughs> oh my god okay uh, thank you to glenn uh for helping us find that video going to the fold uh, that was and crazy turn. just from the um, fandom thought they could restore is that still playing on anything okay sorry oh, i i stopped it sorry about that okay anyways uh, uh that was a fun way to end the show hopefully we don't get dinged for copyright but um, uh, we will put a link to that video in the description and definitely subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is the uh, Gaslight Station. It is a new uh, 
It is a new channel, and almost no one has seen this. Wow, this is Gaslight Station looks pretty incredible. So check out that YouTube channel. That's going to wrap it up for us. We will be back on Friday. Thank you for watching. Alan, anything else that you want to uh, talk about today before we wrap it up? No, the biggest thing is uh, Slam Dance and Sundance coverage is coming up. Uh, go to the Film Threat Interviews channel. Again, uh, our interview with Lucy Lawless is there now. And uh, our interview with Chris Jericho uh, is coming up. And then also... I uh, had a chance to interview the hair, makeup, and costume design team behind the Iron Claw. And that was, uh, we never talked to uh, design people, but I had to do it for the Iron Claw. Well, it, it yeah, and, and we got a lot of compliments on that interview. Yeah. It really went into some depth. Uh, also, I should let you know that I'm actually interviewing the director, uh, Jean-Pierre Genot, the director of Amelie. I'm ah. interviewing the director next week. Uh, he he is uh, an amazing director. He did Delicatessen, City of Lost Children, and also Amelie, which is probably one of my favorite movies. It's getting re-released in February. Yes. But it's one Valentine's of my all-time favorite French films. Uh, it's incredible. And I, I've never spoken to him and cannot wait for that interview. So do, do I bother up. going to an advanced screener or should I just wait for it to come to theaters? It's It's, I mean... No, you don't. I mean, if you've never seen Amelie, you should see it. I own it. I mean, I bought it, yeah. so I have it. But uh, I'm really excited. So our interviews channel is really amping up. And also just go to filmthreat.com. You can read new reviews every day. Every day. Every day. Believe every me. day. There's like, I mean, and during Sundance, it's like 20 new reviews oh my post gosh. every day. All right. That's it for us. See you on Friday, Alan. Let's get out of here.